Hello, uh, welcome to this event celebrating Dr. No to time with the 60th anniversary. Um, we're shortly going to see a couple of feature length interviews with Norman Wanstall and Graham Hartstone covering uh, Dr. No, but also other aspects of, of their career as well. Um, before we do so, we just have a couple of written comments to read out from from two people that wanted to contribute to this to this event, but weren't able to do uh, video uh, interviews. Um, so I'm just going to read those out to everybody. Um, feel free to fast forward this bit if, if it's not of interest to you. Um, after that, I have a few archival comments um, from people that I've interviewed for various other things over the years um, that I just want to read out as well. Sadly, um, uh, the majority of people that I interviewed uh, at that time uh, are no longer with us. Um, I did an event for family and friends back in 2017, and this was the result of uh, a programme that everybody uh, got a copy of um, for the 35th anniversary of, of Dr No. So I shall read some of those comments out um, in uh, in a few moments. Uh, but firstly, the comments from those two that um, uh, wanted to contribute but but couldn't uh, on on screen. Uh, first of all, actress Yvonne Shimmer, who played uh, Sister Lily. Um, this interview was done in April 2022 with the generous help of Steve uh, Oxenri uh, Oxenrider, who has been very supportive in this in this project in particular with me, and I, I thank Steve for, for his efforts uh, in helping me. Uh, so uh, Yvonne writes, Is it really 60 years? That seems so long ago. I remember Sean Connery was very quiet and such a gentleman. The filming went smoothly. According to the script I have, I have seven scenes in Dr. No. I had to let Sean Connery and Ursula Andress in from the decontamination chamber through a steel door with big wheels. The sets were very nicely done. I then asked, six, uh, I then asked Sister Rose if the rooms were ready. Michelle Mock, who played her, we were friends and she shared her apartment with me in London for a while. She was a fashion model and acted on the side. Then I escorted Sean and Ursula along the corridor into the bedroom and showed them their rooms. I only had a small part in Dr. No, but it's an episode of my life I really enjoyed. I came to London from Toronto in the late 50s to pursue acting and within two weeks I was in Tea House of the August Moon on stage down in Worthing. Later I was in the West End uh, with the world of Susie Wong for two and a half years. I was also in the films The Savage, uh, the, sorry, the Savage Innocence with Anthony Quinn, The World of Susie Wong and The Road to Hong Kong. My agent sent my resume in for Dr. No in 62 and they called a group of us in for an interview. The director, Terence Young, worked quickly and my agent said I got the job. We didn't do many retakes. I had a car accident in the late 1960s that ended my acting career, but I'm proud of the few films I've done. I was also in Genghis Khan and an episode of The Avengers. A Chorus of Frogs was the episode. I only had a small part in Doctor No, and no one thought James Bond would continue on like it has. Sean Connery was the original and the best of the Bonds. So thank you, Yvonne, for, for those comments. Uh, the second person who couldn't be uh, with us on video is Charles Edgehill, uh, who played one of the three blind mice. I'm just going to read his interview off my phone. Uh, so I began by asking um, how he got the part in, in Dr. No. And he said, I lived in London, but I go to Jamaica a couple of months uh, each year. I heard Terence Young was in Kingston to make a new movie. I knew him from London because I made Zark with Victor Mature and he knew me. He recognised me when I went to the hotel where they were casting. He was surprised to see me. He said the casting was for one of the guards on the wharf, uh, on the wharf scenes, but all of those parts were gone. Instead, they made me one of the, the blind beggars, and that was a bigger part. The other two were Eric Cloverley and a dentist. His name was Henry Lopez. 
The other thing I remember is where the free beggars are walking along the road in Kingston. I knew that neighbourhood well. The property belonged to my grandmother, who I grew up with. The camera filming uh, us was in a truck with holes so they could shoot us. One lady came along and said to me, you look just like Junior. That was my pet name. She was fooled. And then she dropped a coin in my cup. I heard about the 60th anniversary on the news, on the radio. I'm amazed the film is so popular after all these years. I continue to get fan letters all the time from Germany, Holland, China and many other countries around the world. Please pass on my regards to everyone at the event. I wish everyone a happy 60th anniversary. So that's from, from Charles. And we thank uh, Charles and, and uh, Yvonne for, for those comments. So these comments here were written, uh, were conducted um, interviews over email. Uh, and I'll just read out some some highlights uh, from them. Um, all the all the people I'm going to now be um, reading interviews out uh, about are sadly no longer with us. Um, the first few comments are from David B. Picker, who, as as the audience will know, was a former president of United Artists and was heavily involved in the commissioning of the Bond series uh, in in um, on on film. So this interview took place on 18th of June, 2017. I began by asking um, David the following question. I understand that you were interested in obtaining the rights to the James Bond novels for some time. How did your meeting with Bond producers, Harry Saltzman and Albert R. Broccoli come about? The very long story is in my book, musts, maybes and nevers. So I'll edit an answer for you. I had tried to get the rights to Bond a few years before, late 50s, but Ian Fleming wasn't prepared to sell them at that time. Saltzman and Broccoli knew of my interest and when Columbia Pictures, with whom they had a first link relationship, passed on the project, they came to United Artists, United Artists and myself. How much input did you have on the decision to adapt the, doc, uh, the novel Dr. No as the first Bond film and what made the perfect novel to start the, the series? It was my recommendation to the other execs that Dr. No had all the cinematic elements for a Bond film, and its storyline was not as expensive to shoot as some of the other novels. <clears throat> uh, just fine for what we hoped would lead into a series of films. I understand that Saltzman and Broccoli essentially had complete creative control over the project, but was there anything during production that you, United Artists, uh, insisted upon changing, for example, script, casting, final cut, I believe Roger Moore was on was up for the role at one point. Most important, um, uh, under our, our policy, uh, United Artists, others, uh, after script, budget and cast was approved, the filmmaker had control of the production process, as long as it stayed on budget. Moore may have been discussed, but we wanted an actor who would negotiate sequels up front if the films were successful. Something a more established actor like Moore would be reluctant to do. So we all decided to go with a non-established actor who would make multiple commitments, Sean Connery. Good luck with the event. Best, David Picker. Uh, the next interview is with uh, cast member Stanley Morgan, who played the casino concierge at the beginning of the film. This was 27th of April uh, 2017. What made you want to become an actor? The sheer boredom of banking. Leaving school, I was coerced into a banking career with the old National Provincial Bank and endured four years of unmitigated disinterest in a hole-in-the-wall branch in Wolsey, Cheshire. In 1951, I finally escaped war ravaged Liverpool by emigrating to Canada with the Bank of Nova Scotia. More border. On a perpetual quest for relief, I joined the Sydney S. Brown School of Radio Drama in Toronto and at last found a niche. There I performed in weekly plays over station CKFH and, please note for later, learn to read commercials. How did you land your role in Dr. No? By 1962, I had made four films, four films with Bernard Lee in Merton Park Studios Productions, playing Bernie's Sergeant in The Clue of the Twisted Candle, The Clue of the Silver Key, Partners in Crime and The Share Out. When Bernie was cast as M and Dr. No, he very kindly suggested me for the part of the casino concierge. I went to Pinewood for, for an interview and got lucky. 
Were you familiar with the Bond books before working on the film? Yes, I knew of them, but hadn't read any at that time. What was Sean Connery like to work with? Very amiable, very professional, good sense of humour. On the casino set, they used real casino chips, reportedly valued at 30,000. Then, much more today. I asked Sean how, as James Bond, he would feel if we were held up and the chips were stolen. He gave a wry, uh, a wry smile and muttered, a bloody idiot. Did you get any sense from Connery that he was feeling the pressure of starring in a major film? No, he seemed perfectly relaxed. Sean, of course, is by nature very confident. It was this quality that made him such a successful Bond. Was there a feeling when working on the film that it would, it would be something very special, perhaps a start of something new, or did it feel on the surface like any other movie? The history of the making of Dr. No and the very modest budget would indicate that no more was expected of this production than many others. Naturally, everyone involved applied the greatest degree of professionalism, and I had the sense of being involved in a first-class production. But beyond that, no. The eventual success of Doctor Who, and of course, of the entire franchise, took everyone by surprise. What are your, what are your recollections of director Terence Young? Uh, Patrician, very focused, very polite, and exactly what he wanted and got it. What is the best thing that's come from your association with the world of 007? Simply that, an association. Having been a tiny part of a phenomenally successful franchise and perhaps having personally and perhaps having been personally responsible for that success, no? Well, think about it. If I hadn't located Bond in that casino or had told the bloke from MI6 to get lost, I was on my tea break, etc., there would have been no Doctor No, no franchise, nothing. What's your favourite mem what's your favorite memory from working on Doctor No? Probably working on the studio on the that casino set. After working predominantly on the tiny, very simplistic sets of Merton Park Studios, where they used to accomplish 15 setups a day, walking onto the casino set was akin to entering Howard's Food Hall after a lifetime of shopping at a corner grocery shop. Different league of filmmaking entirely. Very exciting. Did you attend any of the premieres? Alas, no. I did, however, attend a number of autographical and similar events over the years, signing photos, chatting to Bond fans, having a wonderful time. Do you have a favorite Bond film and actor who played 007? Ooh, now, let me think. Tough one. That, um, yes, Dr. No, Sean Connery. Seriously, Dr. No and Sean Connery. Where do you think the James Bond franchise should go from here? And who do you think would make a great, uh, a good successor to Daniel Craig? As a writer of a series, 19 Russ Tobin books, I fully appreciate the difficulty of continuing the Bond franchise. Even with the help of CGI, the production of ever increasing action and interest content must be enormously challenging. I can only offer more of the same, only different. Over to you writers. As for next Bond, having a clue. Apart from Dr. No, what was your favourite film or TV project that you worked on? Having appeared in 20, some 20 films, I can say that I enjoyed every minute of every one of them. I simply love filming. Perhaps though, I particularly enjoyed the Martin, the Merton Park productions. They were small, cosy productions and working so much with Bernard Lee was great fun. Incidentally, details and many still photos of my films are available to view on my website, stanleymorgan.co.uk, including those from Dr. No. I believe since Stanley's passing, his website is still, uh, is, is still online, so I'm sure people can still um, find, um, find it and see the, the, those pictures. Uh, last question uh, for Stanley. According to the Internet Movie Database, your last screen credit was in 1966. What was the reason you stopped acting on screen? In the 1960s, the British film industry was in pretty poor shape. Few films were being made and a few parts were available for actors. I was very fortunate to have found a niche in TV commercials, both in visuals and also as a voiceover, thanks to my Canadian training on the Sydney S. Brown School of Radio Drama, previously mentioned. And while I was able to earn a reasonably a reasonable living from commercials, I was obliged to sit at home waiting for my agent to ring for my next booking. 
This prompted me to start writing to occupy my time. What to write? I decided to draw on my work experiences. After I had quit the Bank of Nova Scotia, I'd done several jobs in Canada and late, uh, later in, this, in southern Rhodesia, where I won a stage acting award, before returning to England to try my luck in the, in the big time. These jobs included, included sewing machine selling, debt collecting, factory working, etc. So, I wrote The Sewing Machine Man, starring our hero Russ Tobin, it sold well. So I wrote another, The Debt Collector, which sold better. I wrote another and another, and at this stage, writing took over from acting, and although I did voiceovers for commercials, 500 altogether, until the mid-1970s, I did not return to film acting after 1966. Best regards, Stanley. The final interview is with Nikki Vandersil, um, the uh, vo voiceover artist for a number of the early, early Bond films. Uh, this took place again by email on the 25th of June 2017. How did you become a voiceover artist? As a trained actress, I've been, I had been doing voiceover work for the BBC and feature films, and I was known in the industry. Can you explain the main reasons why a voiceover artist is brought in to dub an actor? There are various reasons for this. The acting is not good enough, the accent is unacceptable, it cannot be understood at all, or the production realises that the voice is not fit for the character and is not convincing. You voiced all the women in Doctor No apart from Miss Moneypenny, yet the voices are all very distinctive. How do you go about making everyone sound unique? How much was your own ideas and how much was directorial contribution? I was able to change the voice I gave to each part to suit them individually. That meant either lowering my voice or speaking in a higher tone or changing the accent and in intonation. Getting the voice right was the most difficult part of the work. And once that had been done, um, to not just a director's satisfaction, but also mine, the performance could begin. That took less time than shaping the voice. Sometimes it's very easy to tell if someone has been dubbed in a film and the result is often distracting. This is not the case with your performances. What is your opinion? What in your opinion is the secret of good voiceover work? There are two elements to post synchronization, acting and technical. The method used when I did the Bond films and others was, draw, was a drawn line moving across the screen when the speech clip begins and ends. That was most helpful. When the actress is not English, her emphasis is sometimes placed on the wrong syllable. One has to make that sound convincing and still end at the same time as the clip. So acting and the technical aspect go hand in hand. Was there a particular actress you had to revoice on Dr. No or during your time on the Bonds that was particularly challenging? The vocal performance for Jane Seymour, Live and Let Die, posed a, sim uh, posed a challenge simply because I had to mimic her voice. It had to be exactly the same voice as the producers, uh, uh, as, the, as the producers only wanted some bits of her voice revoiced, but otherwise it was her voice. That was difficult. The Chinese voices, for example, Dr. No, were also a challenge as getting the accent right was very difficult. That took a long time and then giving them a realistic performance was also quite taxing. Of all your, of all your revoicing work, do you have one that you are most proud of? I revoiced Raquel Welsh in a, a million years BC because she was incapable of giving the vocal performance needed. The film showed the beginning of language and strange words had to be given meaning, such as hello and my name is. She was unable to pronounce the words and I was brought in to give the performance. She was recently interviewed by Piers Morgan and asserted she spoke, she'd spoken her lines. My name was not mentioned. I'm proud of my work, but it helps be recognised. My contributions have been constantly ignored and denied. So having done a good job on so many actresses when they go on to be admired and rewarded for their roles, half of which was my work, as I did for Ursula Andress in Dr. No and her other films, this raises different emotions in me than other than pride. You were involved in voiceover work for the Bond films for well over a decade. Did you have any involvement with Harry Saltzman and Albert, uh, Albert R. Buckley? And what are your lasting impressions of the two? 
I saw a lot of them on set. They were friendly enough. Cubby was a gentle person, whereas Harry was more forceful. I never had I never had a bad experience with either of them. I just wish they had given me on-screen credits for my work and helped me more. After 1979's Moonraker, you left the film industry to pursue a political career. How did this come about? I left the film industry in 79 to study law. I am a fully qualified barrister and a member of Mid Temple. I met the barrister Mella MP, who asked me to become his assistant in the House of Commons, which I did for a couple of years. I was then invited to become a press officer for the Southampton TV station TVS. I was based in the press gallery of the House of Commons, interviewing MPs and ministers. That was very interesting work. I became good friends with John Major MP, met many prime ministers, Margaret Thatcher and countless other household names of, of, of the time. They were, they were very happy years. When I left the house, I, found a I founded a theatre group and, and we performed mainly well-received plays. One year we performed at the end of the Fringe Festival. What is it like to be involved with such successful film franchise and how does it feel that you have so many fans asking about things that you did over 50 years ago? As I've indicated earlier, apart from using my voice and credited in 10 Bond films, I've never been invited to, to any premieres, official reunions at Pinewood or anything else and great efforts have been made to exclude me from the Bond franchise. The money I was paid for the usual £25 per session uh, sorry, the money I, I was paid was the usual £25 per session, and because I only took one or two sessions to complete the revoicing, the company did not have to pay me much. So I have made no money at all from my work. I have had neither financial nor professional acknowledgement from the Bond franchise, so perhaps you may understand what I think of it. My consolation regarding the Bond films is the, is the support for my fans both here and in Germany, to whom I am grateful for their continuing support and friendship. All the best for now, Nikki. Um, I must add that I did, um, although this interview was completed by email, Nikki did very kindly agree to, to let me come and visit her, her home uh, in London uh, for a private signing of just um, my, my own personal collection. Um, her and her husband um, greeted, um, were, were lovely, very accommodating, um, although we were just there to sign a few items. We talked for a good hour and a half to, about films, politics and all sorts of sorts of things. That She was a lovely person uh, to, uh, to know. As you can tell from the comments, a bit disgruntled because of perhaps being a bit sidelined um in the in the bomb community um not not by fans but perhaps just some people not perhaps acknowledging her her work of course it was a different time back then in, in terms of the credits being a lot shorter so people like nikki and so many other um crew and also class were never given formal credits on 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 films um so i think she obviously has sort of a love hate relationship with um with with Bond, I think because of that, and maybe the, the film industry in general, rather than perhaps the, the, a problem with, with with Bond, just the way that the industry was back back in in, in the sixties. Um, but of course, as I said, she's the one thing that she is so passionately positive about was her fans, and she was always very happy to for, to to, uh, to answer. Um, those questions are a few things that, that I have not read out because it was such a long interview so she was very generous she she um, just invited me into, into, her, into her home having never met me before she was she was a very lovely uh, human being um, my only regret is that I didn't start to do, do these events um, until the last couple of years because if Nikki still had been been alive I'm sure we, I'm sure she would have loved to have, have come on and talked about her career and partly to obviously raise the profile of forgotten people like herself that get kind of lost um, in, in 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 an industry that may just focus on sort of sort of bigger players. So hopefully, if this goes in a, in some small way, just to raise her profile and for for a few fans that might not know the name. Then that's that. That would be absolutely wonderful. 
Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for, for putting up with this very long-winded um, uh, start to, to, to the event. Hopefully some of those comments uh, you, you, found, you found interesting. So I will uh, now hand over to the pre-recorded interviews with Norman and Graham. Uh, enjoy. Thank you. Bye. Um, so, so first I want to say thank you, Norman, for joining us for this uh, 60th anniversary event celebrating Dr. No. Um, so um, I'm just going to go through a series of questions about your work on, on the film and what your thoughts are about this, you know, this, this, this classic film that's, I can't believe it's been 60 years, really, since... Uh, amazing, amazing. Yeah. Makes me feel very old. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and they've just started to re-release them in the, the cinema, of course, for, for the 60th anniversary. And um, I saw Dr. No last, last week on the big screen. And it was lovely to see these films in their natural habitat, as it were. Sure. Yeah. Because I don't know when the last time you saw the film on the uh, on the big screen. Well, <clears throat> they used to have events at Palmer Studios, hmm. and when I think it was the when they were trying to celebrate the the bond, the number of bonds, they decided to actually show Dr. No, because that symbolised the beginning and uh, that was the first time I'd actually seen it in a long, long time. And I, I saw it from a different point of view. Suddenly I was a member of the audience, not a member of the team. Because there's enough time had gone by to distance yourself from the... Um, yeah. Um, so the first question I had for you, uh, Norm, was uh, about um, the, the very distinctive opening sequence of the film with the with the with the dots and the and the sound that Monty Norman put on, and of course the wonderful um, title sequence, because of course this was groundbreaking, wasn't it at the time? Yes, it was. Hmm. Yeah, strangely enough, I don't know how it came about, but I ended up being in the cutting room alone with with uh, Monty Norman, <laughs> and we sat together, and he was looking over my shoulder on the moviola, <laughs> enjoying trying to trying to see how he could synchronize or use the little sound dots. Hmm. A lot of people think that I produced those, but I've always said, no, that was one sound I had nothing to do with. I don't know where he got them from. Yeah. And we spent quite a lot of time on there. What actually was the outcome? I can't quite recall, but he was obviously learning from it hmm. and, exper and experimenting. But where he actually obtained that bleeping sound, I have no idea. Yeah, I think it's one of the, the, those mysteries. I know that when Dying of the Day came out on, for the 40th anniversary, um, the composer David Arnold cheekily used that sound in one of his music cues. So, um, oh, right. a little homage to, to Dr. No. Um, um, it could be, so, what did you think of the um, use of the James Bond theme here on this, on the opening credits? And what did you think of when you first heard the James Bond theme? Well, I was so impressed. I mean, knowing the sort of film it was, having a pretty good insight into the theme and the type, suddenly th there was something new about it and something a bit more ambitious and, and obviously something relative to the fact that it was a spy film. Hmm. And um, yeah, my reaction, I mean, it's a long time ago now, but I do recall as a young assistant sitting there with this gentleman <laughs> on my moviola, uh, I, I thought this is something interesting here, you know. Mm. I mean, normally we would never be involved with titles or credits. It's, it's, it's a totally separate issue. We would be, the titles and credits would be put on at the end and that was it. But to have somebody with me who was experimenting and learning and practicing was really quite something. And mm. So I, I probably saw those opening sequence at a very early stage. Mm. Uh, and what did you make of Monty Norman as a uh, as a person? Do you have any memories of of the man? Uh, no, not really. Only that, um, that I mean, it's so long ago now, of course, and I was just a youngster. But I enjoyed his company and I enjoyed his enthusiasm, mm. and I felt that he was going to be of great value to the film. But it was too early for me to really assess exactly what was happening. Mm. Um, yeah. But no, full marks to the guy. You know, I mean. I was only reading once. I think he made half a million nearly in in um, royalties on the theme of Doctor No. Absolutely amazing, isn't it? Mm. 
Oh yeah, I know. I know. I would have thought you get something for every Bond film, so you must be quite a rich man. I, I, I would have thought. Um, yeah, but it's a remarkable theme, isn't it? Everybody remembers it. Everybody loves it, and it's it's there. You know, he did it. I think it was arranged. It wasn't arranged by him, was it? And no, John Barry did the arrangement. John Barry, yeah. yeah. In fact, I always get slightly confused because you, it often says if you go on the internet that that um, Monty Norman actually did the sound, uh, music for the film. Hmm. And so people get a bit confused about whether or not he did it and it was just arranged. Hmm. Um, I, I think there was a big legal case on that very point, actually. I think it was in the 80s or... or, or I think there was too, yeah. And, but yeah, if you, want, if you look on the credits of all the, the, the Bond films, it, it will say... James Bond theme by Monty Norman, so it doesn't doesn't credit John Barry at all for his arrangement, which is a, a bit odd. No, that's right. No, yeah. probably quite right too. But yeah, you couldn't imagine the Bond films without that iconic um, iconic theme. Um, I wanted to ask you, Norm, um, how you became involved with with, with Bond to to begin with. Um, yeah, well, very 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 briefly. I trained at Pyman Studios for three years. I was given a contract for three years as a trainee. That's all I was. I was just a trainee. And over those three years, I worked with sound editors, editors, sound editors, editors. So by the end of the three years, I had a pretty good knowledge of what the editing department was all about. And I made up my mind that one day I would like to become a film editor as opposed to a soundtrack editor. Hmm. But as it turned hmm. out, um, a couple of colleagues took me to one side and explained to me that probably the most legendary sound editor in the country, a man called Winston Ryder, was looking for an assistant. And they mm -hmm. said that uh, he's not an easy guy to work with, but we think you would be absolutely right for him. And so I had to decide whether or not to have another three year contract or break out into the big wild world and work with one of the most prestigious guys. I mean, his credits were incredible. Bridge on the River Choir, Lawrence of Arabia, you know, anyway, Cut a long story short, I decided I would go with him, even though my ambition was to be a film editor. I still thought to work with a man of that quality would be a privilege. Mm. And I did, and we got on extremely well. And we worked on three major American movies. One was John Paul Jones. The other was Solomon and Sheba. And the third one, of course, was Sink the Bismarck. Yeah. And uh, Sink the Bismarck, of course, was... To, edited by Peter Hunt. Peter Hunt and I got on very well. I mean, we were all a big team. And then towards the end of the film, I heard that his assistant was moving on to jobs in London. And I thought, wow, if Peter would hire me as his assistant, it would give me a chance to get back into the film editing side of movies. Hmm. And he did hmm. take me on. And that was the start of a seven year relationship, would you believe, which is mm -hmm. a long time in the freelance world. Mm -hmm. But we um, we worked on four four feature films. And then, of course, he was given the script of Dr. No. And that was really mm -hmm. how I came to be related to the Bond films. And mm -hmm. uh, the rest is history, really. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have a, a, a particular uh, a favorite memory of, of, of Peter Hunt in, as a um, or what it was a bit more, a bit more of a feeling of um, what the man was was like. Oh, I have, I have a great respect for Peter Hunt. He was a single guy. He didn't have family and all that kind of thing. Mm. He was dedicated to the film business. He had huge talent. I never actually went into learning his background, how he actually arrived at becoming him. I don't know why. We never really seem to talk about how he became a film editor because he was much older than me obviously mm. but I could tell that not only was he a very skilled technician very dedicated but also he had his eye on the idea of becoming a director mm -hmm. I could tell I could just see the way his manner and his attitude and what interested me was the fact that he told me that he had throughout his career had a chance to become very knowledgeable about lenses in cameras yeah. and I thought oh oh here we go then because you know most people in the film business unless you're involved in the um, um, camera side of films 
you wouldn't have the opportunity to learn about the technology of lenses, but I could tell that he felt very confident. And I, could, I thought to myself, yes, this is all beginning to lead towards something far greater. Mm. And what was interesting was that because as we got after about four Bond films, I think he could see that the possibilities were getting greater, that he might actually be given a Bond film to direct. Mm. He started to spend more time on the set. And that meant that he trusted me to assemble the film. Right. Which, of course, was everything for me, the, the chance to actually learn how it was to cut film together and build a scene. And his attitude was, Norm, you just assemble it. I'm, I'm used to that. I'm only interested in the fine cutting. Mm. So he, he could take over what I'd done and say, yeah, that's fine. And then he would get stuck in and he would take out all the frames. Excuse me, there's something on here that is in my way. Uh, yes, so and that was a development over about four four Bond films that I could tell the things were beginning to change. I was getting a chance to learn how to cut, and he was beginning to spend more time watching the directing. Hmm. And of course, the rest is history. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it has Peter Hunt had a very um, unique editing style. Would take, as you said, removing frames and sort of jump cutting and cutting on things that probably the editor's rule book said don't not to do. Um, and of course, that is partly why the early Bond films are so are so successful, isn't it? The, the way it's edited. Yes, you've said it right there. He actually, I remember him saying to me very early on, he said, Norm, he said, if we're going to make this film a success, it's got to move. Hmm. This has got to move, this film. No hanging about, no this and that. Move. He said, and then we then the pace will suit the film. Yeah. And he set up really, if you think about it, he started that style of editing and it was carried on right through the right through the rest of the bonds. Well, you know, 90% of them. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, I think he uh, uh, a lot of credit is given to Peter for the success of Doctor No. I think it would have been a success anyway, but I think his contribution was enormous. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, what was your knowledge of James Bond when you came on the film? Had, had you read the, the books? Uh, any knowledge previous? The... No, I hadn't. No. I, in fact, I don't know many people that were on it that had, but mm. there are always those that were dedicated Fleming fans. Mm. But uh, no, I never did. And I think the reason I didn't start reading the books was I didn't want to be thrown by the by the book and then see the film and think, well, why aren't they doing this or why aren't they doing that? I thought, take the films as they are. They've been scripted accordingly. And, mm. and, and no, I hadn't. It would have been interesting, I suppose, to have read Dr. No to see just how close it was. But you've never been tempted to, do, to read it in the, the years since or anything like that? No, I didn't, no. Um, because I, I, I suppose, uh, yeah, apart from the, the Bond books, there had been a, a, a TV, not a, not a TV movie, but a, a, an episode of TV based upon Casino Royale, the novel, with Barry Nelson. At, yes. at, I don't know if you ever saw saw that the version. Of I Casino. did. I seem to remember. I did see some of it, but I couldn't. I couldn't. Yeah. Didn't mean anything to me. It wasn't. No, my, it, it was, wasn't it, for it, me. It was very. I couldn't relate that to James Bond in any way. No, no. I think it certainly showed what. Chloe Broccoli and Harry Saltzman got right versus, say, you know, what they did in 50, 54, certainly. That's right. Um, uh, so, uh, let's see. so I was just wondering, back to Monty Norman, how much of a contribution you thought you made to, in terms of your, up to your sound and how much did so, because I think there were certain sequences where Monty Norman's music was was dropped because maybe it didn't fit a scene, and then your sound effects had to ha, had to come in. Um, how do you think Monty Norman um, complemented the film as opposed to say John Barry in the in the, in the later films? Well, it's, it's just, this is my problem really is knowing how much was down to him and how much was mm. was down to um, 
Oh, oh, John Barry, yeah. Barry, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, generally speaking, on all films, there is always this problem that there isn't time for the composer and the sound editor to get their heads together. Only in my whole career was I ever able to do that once, and it was absolutely invaluable. Mm. You know, he would say, well, I'll tell you what, if I do this and you do that, we'll, yeah, I said, yeah, great, or no, or, but that never happened. And so, so often in films, the musician does what he thinks is right, and the sound editor does what he thinks is right, and so often they don't actually blend and so, so often something has to go, which is mm. very sad. And a very good example in, in Dr. No is the tunnel sequence. Yeah. yeah. Um, I knew when I heard, in fact, the last time I saw Dr. No, I couldn't quite understand the electronic sound that I put over that seemed to have gone. It started and then came in later with the twang, but. I didn't hear it going throughout, which I thought it did on the original dub. Yeah. Um, but anyway, there was a case where I heard that sound in the a sound effects library, immediately thought, my God, how that would look over the, over the tunnel. Mm. So I got it anyway, even though I knew there was going to be music. It, it was a scene that had been assigned for music. Mm. And so I just put it, put it next to it and on the chart said um, only as a substitute or words to that effect. And then I wasn't there when they were dubbing it, but to my pride and joy, the music was given the big elbow and my track was used. Yeah. I don't know if that's any people, I think people did say to me that they weren't very happy with the music over that scene. So maybe yeah. that yeah. was an occasion where something had to go. So I think all, all the music was uh, Monty Norman's. Um, it, John Barry didn't work on the score uh, at, at all for, for Dr. No. So I believe, no, um, I'm, yes. The only thing, of course, he did was, was do the arrangement of the, of the James Bond theme. And I gather that certain sequences, like the tunnel scene, didn't work. So lots of Monty Norman's score was cut and the Bond theme was kind of a, a substitute in many in many scenes, so that's why it's 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 repeated so often because some of the other music didn't didn't work in the film. So I think oh, that's interesting. Do you yeah. know I've never really thought about that. Mm. That is interesting. If that's a fact. Yeah, 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 I believe that's what what what, what happened. Certainly in, in in certain sequences. Yeah. Um, uh, so mm. the bond the bond sounds, particularly in 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 your five films, always seem to have a to be larger than life. Was that a conscious decision that, that you and people like Peter Hunt had going into the film, or did let's make this, you know, must make this makes a huge sound, you know, cameras if you like, or was it the the film that dictates the sound? How how does it how does it evolve? Oh, I I know what you're saying. Hmm. People often ask this kind of question, and I always say that. The film demanded, the film de de decided the sort of sound that the film's going to have. And I've never forgotten when the sound department of Palmer Studios saw the first cut of Dr. No. And I've never forgotten it because the um, chief mixer there, Gordon McCullum, he was a pretty tough guy. You know, he didn't mess about with Gordon. And uh, I knew that they were watching it. I knew that they were seeing it. And I came back to my cut cutting room and there was this tap on my door. And I opened it, I couldn't believe it. And there was there was Gordon McCullum standing there like a little boy looking for sweets. <laughs> and he literally looked at me, he said, Norm, when can we start? Now, I know in his whole career, he had never done that before. Yeah. <laughs> but he could see that just for once, there was a chance that we could contribute to the film sound wise rather than just compliment it. Mm -hmm. he, could, he could see just as I could see that there were sounds there that we were going to have produced that no one had ever heard before. And this is one of the things about Bonds. When you've got gadgets and futuristic elements, sound has to be created for it. So it, it tends to give the film a, um, a, a feature, you know, a style. Mm. And so we were, to many, many ways, I think I was carried along by what the film had had picture-wise. Mm. 
Yeah. You know, I knew that I knew that there was nowhere we could go and get that electronic do door in Dr. No's apartment or and I knew that that lift that Sean and 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 go up in. I knew that that had to be a completely different sound. It couldn't sound like Mark Suspenser's. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and I knew that when he crushed the little idol in his metal hand, mm. that had to be mm. way over the top. Yeah. And when it dropped, yeah. it's probably the most favorite sound I've ever created. When that drops onto that table, my goodness, what a sound that is. Mm. Normally, most mm. sound editors would have just made a sound. Yeah. But that sounds like a Tom Waits just hit the table, you know. Yeah. And I get great thrill from hearing it. Hmm. It's a tricky one, really. It's a, it's a bit of everything. Yeah. So I suppose if someone was to try and define what a Bond sound was, it would be larger than life, something you would normally hear in the, say, in Marks and Spencers. Or it's, it's, it's something that's almost got a unique, not other otherworldly, almost sort of, so, um, almost a, a, an unreal quality, but not an unreal, but enhanced, enhanced. Sort enhanced. Of I think enhanced is probably quite a good word. A very mm. good example is Odd Jobs Flying Hat. Mm. I remember I was at a running once and there was a bloke sitting there and when he threw that hat, this bloke leapt out of his seat. <laughs> <laughs> he just wasn't expecting it. Mm. And... Um, I always remember I was invited onto a program by, that was read, led by uh, Esther Ranson. She used to have a program every week on a different theme. And she did one on awards. And uh, they had various people on there that had won awards and there was an audience and everything. And they invited me on uh, to, to bring the Oscar on. And before she announced me, she, uh, she, she threw this she got this top hat and threw it into the air. And of course it didn't make any noise. And then she said, and this is what Norman put on, over it in Bond. Mm. And when she played it on the screen, the whole audience applauded. I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was just a reaction because it was so over the top. You know, you, you could have put lots of sounds over that hat. Could have been just a <laughs> yeah. But we got away with doing something a bit more than that, and um, and that was the reaction. Hmm. It was a good example. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that's part. Of the a, same with same within Russia with love the, in the fight sequence on the train. One of the greatest scenes in the whole of the Bond series. But just to hear those those wrestling sounds, which I shot. You know, when I say I shot, I. I replaced it, put it that way. It wasn't the original. It was all yeah. new. And I, I would love, love to watch that scene anytime because it's mm. it's so dramatic, so memorable. Mm. Plus the whistle of the train as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, when they, and when they break the, the glass of the window and you hear the, yeah. the, the tracks and everything. And uh, That's I'm, right. You might not know, know, know this, uh, Norm, but uh, there's a scene in Dr. No where Bond goes to visit Strangway's house. And Bond yes, is I know it. holding a picture up of Strangway's and then the, the film yes. sort of jumps a little bit. You yes, do you know, I don't know how you came to notice that because I would think 99% may have subconsciously been aware of something but never registered it, not once. Mm -hmm. But I know, I know, of course, it's there. And that was the bravery of Peter. He, no other cutter would have done a thing like that. There was obviously a long pause there that he didn't need. Hmm. And he took a chance. And it is so fractionally to actually take a piece of film from there to there and find it match is a chance in a million, really. Yeah. And he found that within a fraction of a jump, he could get away with it. Ah, right. And he did it. Yeah. And that's the way he he operated. To, uh, it was very, very brave. And I'm amazed that you actually have registered it, actually. And it, it, the fact that he was always looking for a way of moving it on, taking, taking someone through a door 
one moment they were going in, next minute they were coming out. But you didn't say, wait a minute, you just mm. accepted it. Yeah. But Peter yeah. took a lot of film out there, mm. you know. And um, this was the one of my favorite stories. Well, it's not a favorite story, really, was when we were working with Guy Hamilton. Because Peter and Guy never really got on at all. I think, well, Guy, I got spent quite a lot of time with Guy after the film was finished in later mm -hmm. times. And he said to me, he said, I, I inherited Peter Hunt. <laughs> and I think he resented the fact that he had a man that was so respected, was so known for what he could do, that they just left the film to Peter. You know, the producers never came and checked anything. They just left it to Peter. Mm -hmm. Well, Guy wasn't used to that. And we were sitting in a in the viewing theatre one day, and um, he said to Peter, he said, what, what happened there? And Peter said, oh, don't worry. He said, there was a little pause. And Guy said, pause, bollocks, put it back. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Mm. I could not believe it. No one spoke to Peter like that. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. And, yeah, I suppose a lot of directors try and bring their own crew, don't they, onto to films or their own composers or so, whereas the, the Bonds always worked where they had, you know, an editor in residence of composer they always use. So that must have suited some directors more than others. Uh, yes, um, yes. Um, um, I wanted to talk about some of, some of the cast, um, but perhaps first of all, Ursula Andres. Um, do you remember Ursula at all, either during the filming or, or afterwards? No, this is one of the few problems with uh, being in the editing side is that we we are completely separate from the production crew, and apart from going to rushes, we don't actually see them. And of course, even if we even at rushes, you wouldn't have the actors. They're they're, they're never at the rushes. Um, it, the only time I did see Ursula. Oh, lovely! Yeah. Mm hmm. That's a nice photograph. Yes. Um, what happened was in those days, there used to be a lot of get togethers because unlike other films, you, you don't have fan clubs. Other films don't have fan clubs, but the Bond films were beginning to build fan clubs. And so people like Graham Rye and people like that used to say, well, let's give the fans a treat and we would have these events at Palmer Studios. The fans are invited, first come, first served, mm -hmm. and they would have a nice meal and it would give them a chance to meet the technicians, meet the actors, and it gave them a tremendous thrill. To them, it, you couldn't put a price on, on those events. And so I used to go to them regularly, of course, and it, not only did I have the pleasure of meeting the fans and, and signing their autographs and their film pictures and everything, but I got a chance to actually meet some of the people that I hadn't had a chance to meet before. Hmm. And um, when Ursula was there, the queue for her signature was <laughs> endless. Bet, yeah. It was quite a big event. I don't think it was at Pinewood. I think it was somewhere else. Hmm. Anyway, Graham Rye, who was a very good friend of mine, he marched me up to her and he, he said, look, um, Norman wants to um, won a, a, an Oscar and I think he deserves to have your signature. So <laughs> she said, well, I didn't work on any other, I didn't work with him. He, she, he said, no, but I, I think I would like you to have a picture with him and 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 sign it and so i went at the front of the queue and that was the result oh wonderful yeah and we did actually sit and chat after that i, I seem to remember she had her son with her yeah and i remember yeah. saying to her is your son in the business but i don't think he was hmm. um i was sitting with her and guy hamilton hmm. but obviously you can't get to know anybody incredibly well just in, in in that kind of atmosphere in in one meeting oh, but yeah. i was very very pleased to have the chance to mm. have that picture wonderful i, I think that was a, an autographical event i believe i think um oh where uh, it was um a company well a company called Showmasters runs a convention called autographica and i think they oh autographica I yes that might have been 
the Ursula event, yeah. Okay. Is this one? Oh yeah, uh, Shirley Eaton, yeah. Oh yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, that's a nice one. Uh, one of my favourites. Oh yes, one for Eunice Gayson, yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. Oh, do honour, yes, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, that was, uh, so we've got Shirley, um, Tanya Mallet, and my, uh, Greg Hamilton, yourself, and, and of course, dear Desmond Llewellyn as well, yeah. Um, That's right. I, I, yes. I, I went I, I went to that event. Uh, I remember that one. It's my first Bond event I ever went to. That one. That was, oh right. Yeah. I was I was twelve, I think. Oh, how about that? Um, yeah, no, I used to enjoy those events enormously. So I was wondering um, what your opinion of of Terence Young was, because obviously you did three films with Terence as a director. How was how would, would Terence say be different to say Guy Hamilton, for example? Well, again, the big problem is that obviously um, it was different for Peter because he would obviously uh, have reasons to talk to Terence, hmm. but me in the cut with me in the cutting room, I wouldn't have any reason to meet him at all. No, and I think the only time that I well put it this way, I like everybody else i had a great respect for him because he everybody said that he should have been he should have been james bond you know he yeah. he was the right yeah. type the right background the right stature and of course it's famous that he took sean into the um into his tailors and rigged him out to make him look like a real uh, naval gentleman and mm. um, yeah he he played the part but the only time I did come in, in touch with him was, um, I was just thinking whether he not, did he, did he direct Russia with Love? He did, yes. He, he yes. Did. Yeah. No, I'm just thinking, there were two times, I remember on Russia with Love, yes, it was Russia with Love, I happened to go on to, uh, normally I was still working. When they were mixing all the tracks together, I was normally still in the cutting room and working away because the, you're always up against time. Mm. And then anyway, I did happen to go down there. And of course the, the scene of the gypsy camp was meant to have been shot in Turkey. But of course it was all shot on the back lot. So everyone was talking English. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that I had to bring the whole thing to life with the with the belly dancer and the two girls wrestling and everything and i've never forgotten it because on doctor no everything i asked for i was frowned upon because they said we don't have the money you know you're you're costing us a fortune and they made it very difficult for me very difficult hmm. but anyway on russia with love i took a chance i had tongue in cheek and I walked into the production office and they said, well, what do you want, Norm? I said, well, I want um, 10 Turkish men, 10 Turkish women, and as many Russians as you can get. Mm -hmm. And the production manager looked at the calendar and he said, well, would Thursday be all right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, how I kept a straight face, I'll never know. Mm. I thought, well, now at last we're making movies because mm. If you can picture what it was like on Doctor No, it was a huge thing for me to take on a picture of that size. I've never ever done a film, work, worked on a film before as a sound editor. Hmm. I had all the pressure, and yet they were still, and I, even though I knew I had to do it very professionally, like Winston Ryder used to, they were picking on me because I was costing them money. The reason I was costing them money, of course, was because I was using recording theatres. Yeah. And so the yeah. studio was charging them. Anyway, um, anyway, they, he did provide me with all these voices. I had a wonderful session in the recording theatre. I showed them the film and they were talk, you know, 
calling out to the ballet dancer, and all in Turkish. It was absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. And when um, when um, Terence saw it, he looked open eyed and he said, "Where are all these voices coming from?" Mm. Peter said, "Well, Norman recorded them. You needed them, didn't you?" And he said. Amazing. <laughs> I think it just took him by surprise. You know, I think he just thought he was going to hear a, a gypsy camp, but never thought about the fact that it had to be Turkish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was a nice moment for me. And then, of course, there was the occasion when he asked me if I would come to London with Pedro Almandares. Mm, yes. And he explained to me that the poor man was desperately ill. Yeah. And that they they wanted me to t come to London with him and Terence and record all the lines that one would normally record on an actor that weren't quite adequate for the forum. It was post-synchronising that all actors do. Hmm. And they knew that they had to get it before he left because he was about to leave because he was so ill. And the three of us went to a recording studio in, in Soho. And I've never forgotten it because it, Pedro was so professional. Never for a moment did you think the man was struggling or whether he was doing it out of duty. He just did it like a professional. And I, I was speechless, really, absolutely speechless. Hmm. And he came away from there. And I think two days later, he took his life. Yeah, yeah, I think he did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's... But it was nice to work with Terence. Terence was full of respect. He told Pedro, you know, Norman's, Norman's here to do it properly and correctly and so we're in good hands and and I, I respected Terence for that. Hmm. Uh, do you remember working with voice artists um, Robert Reity and uh, Nicky Vandersil? Well yes I, I didn't work with Robert Reity on the bomb films hmm. because I was always on the sound effects side yeah. but Robert Reity was a legend everybody every sound editor in the country knew Robert Reity I think I probably did used him on previous films but he was so versatile you knew, you knew that Robert would do this and that and um, he was a highly respected soundtrack uh, and voice recordist mm. yeah and um, and then the, the jobs he did on which was the one he did um, Russia with love yes it was wasn't it he did, he did some on Dr No he did the voice of Strangways in Dr No and one of the superintendents in Jamaica. So he does two voices in. in oh, fair his... enough. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I wasn't aware that he had done Strange Ways. I imagine Strange Ways did his own voice. <laughs> I uh, couldn't. I think that's the secret, isn't it, of a good voice artist to make it seem that all oh, this is the actual, like, a bit like um, Michael Collins in Goldfinger. You wouldn't know that it wasn't. No, you, you would not. You, you, you how they do it i don't know to get it sort of matching that voice and that performance and you know the emotional side of it it's very um fantastic yeah i was just wondering what the reason would have been hmm. I, I i mean the voice was perfect for the face in, in strange ways but i was just thinking i wonder what was wrong with strange ways voice the actor that played it yeah um i'd have to look into a bit more but i think yeah timothy moxon i think played uh, Strangways and and um, I suppose like a lot of voices it might just be wanting something a bit clearer or yes wanted to be a bit more gentleman like yeah, yeah. A little like that really I suppose like Shirley Eaton's or Ursula Andress's voice it's just wanted to perhaps remove something in there didn't quite fit perhaps but um, um, and of course that was Nicky Vandersil's skill as well wasn't it doing all absolutely absolutely i mean all actors are very good at post synchronizing mm. and the reason of course is that they have their own rhythm and so yes. to recapture the way they said a line before is no big deal for them but people like reality and, and, and nikki that could work their way into somebody else's pacing and and is, is quite remarkable really mm. and i've always said to people that Doctor, uh, the Goldfinger is probably the greatest masterpiece in the history of post synchronizing. Hmm. Even yeah. I, when I, when I watch Goldfinger, I am absolutely spellbound. I never, for a moment, say to myself, "You realise he's revoiced, do you?" I never do. 
Mm. I do with other people, but not with him because it is the perfect voice in every respect. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The synchronizing, the weight, the threat, the accent, everything. I don't know how he did it. Yeah. I, I think one of the most successful bits of music in Dr. No is probably when uh, the tran the tran tran tranchello is climbing up Bond's arm and the sinister music, and then Bond's smashing the tranchello with his. Absolutely, basket. absolutely. Um, that was a wonderful score, wasn't it? And people yeah. reacted in the cinema. They, I think, they were so tensed up by the tarantula that when that bang, bang, bang went down, they were so relieved they were clapping. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure they clapped when I saw it. Yeah, and again, something it was sheer that, relief, you know, because yeah. that scene was so well shot. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? And um, I think quite complex because they had to have that. So the bed was vertical, like I am now, and they had to sort of tip the film, I think, to sort of make it look like he was lying down. So very technically difficult, difficult to do. And and of course, having those three bangs in, in, in another Bond in another film may have seemed a bit cliche the way over the top but for bond it, it, it fitted uh rather perfectly yeah you could you could call that a genuine bond sound couldn't you <laughs> yeah yes you did yeah you didn't have to be that loud and no. didn't have to have the music and the bangs all in sync <laughs> well i think one of your one of, one of my favorite sounds of yours is, is is it's it's a bit of an odd one but there's a bit in thunderball where bond is at the health club and he's investigating what he's, you know, um, he's got suspicion. So he's investigating the, the health, the health, the health bar and he opens a pair of curtains quite uh, sharply. And there's this wonderful ripping sound as the curtains open up. And I, and I just, again, that's a larger than life and it's very striking sound. So I've always- I've Oh, always... I have to, I have to listen to that. Mm. Yeah, it's very good. Um, and then, uh, did you ever meet Lois Maxwell at any, any events or anything like that? Well, Lois Maxwell, I was at one, I was at one event at Pinewood and um, that we had a meal and I looked round and there she was standing there, but I didn't get a chance to actually, I would have loved to have had a conversation with her, but she was busy, I was occupied and, but I just felt it was nice to actually see her in the flesh. But, yes. Yeah. To actually talk to her was unfortunately out of the question. Um, that would have been that was a shame. Yeah, I mean, I I got her autograph at that at that event, but of course, as a, as a twelve year old, you, I would love to go back to, as me as an adult and just talk to all these wonderful people, and it would be yes. Experience. I was, I was. Oh, you, you got her. You got her autograph, did you? I did. Yeah, yeah. She ah, well me, done. I think it was the menu. I think that. Uh, for the for the meal that we had there so uh, that was nice oh i see she typed that yeah i see okay and, uh, and, <laughs> and desmond signed the menu as well so that was very nice but um so um um so, so when so there's lots of uh uh location work on on dr no so how did you go about creating the atmosphere of jamaica and making the environments you know, sound natural because, of course, the the sounds perhaps you would have been recorded on the at the time wouldn't have been usable for the the, the final film. Yes, <clears throat> the the one person that sound editors do frequently have a lot a lot of connection with is is the sound recordist, mm -hmm. and the sound recordist is very aware of what the sound editor is involved in and, and the work that he's got to do. <clears throat> So all the time they're on location, they're always very conscious of the, of the fact that they're in a place where the atmosphere or the machine or the whatever it is, is going to be invaluable to the sound editor. So while everybody else is having coffee and drinks and all the rest of it, the poor sound man goes off and records what we call wild tracks. Mm. And that was could be very, very, very beneficial, especially if they're in an atmosphere or in a country where the background is, is fairly unique. Mm -hmm. And so when they when they came back, they would immediately contact the sound editor and say, right, I've got some tapes. 
and they would be we would be so grateful for them if they hadn't been able to do that then obviously we would probably have to go to sound effects libraries hmm. and try and compile them ourselves hmm. the, the, i think the most interesting story about that is that john mitchell and i became very very close we both respected each other greatly and he was 101 percent conscious of the sound editor all the time he was away he was thinking what can i record what can i record that that would be of value to them and uh, of course he with those fairy marine craft in russia with love those boats those powerful boats he was so dedicated to the fact that there was so, they were so invaluable that he asked if he could have a cap and be one of the crew so that he would look as though he's one of the crew in one of the boats but in fact he was recording all the sound as he was going on mm. and um when he got back he had this pile of tapes i couldn't believe it and, and we even arranged to go in on a saturday to hear them i may have told you this before but when he ran them of course the ferry marine was a very highly highly refined boat <laughs> And uh, it takes me back to you talking about Bond sounds. Mm. And they were just like vacuum cleaners. I didn't know what to say. We, yeah. we went on and on and on, tape after tape after tape. I didn't say anything, but I knew that I could never use them. Mm. Because a Bond, a bond uh, boat chase couldn't be like a load of humming, dumb, humming sounds. It had to be a roar. It had to be water and whoosh. So unfortunately, uh, I replaced ninety percent of it. Hmm. Yes, but, but was, I only use an example of where a, a good sound recordist would always be conscious of the sound editor. Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely in invaluable. I mean, uh, there's invaluable. Yeah, they're seeing the Doctor No um, on uh, on jetties and things, and you hear the backgrounds of the the ships and all that sort of thing, and and the voices in the in the background, which again just give it a realistic, you know, sense of oh, this is a real place. This is touchable, tangible. Yes, yes, mm. yes. All backgrounds are invaluable. John Mitchell and I were able to go back into the volcano and record, record all everything inside that building afterwards. Mm. You know, yeah. when they were gone. Yeah. But he would have. Uh, he would have recorded the atmosphere in there anyway and i think there's really it's not very often though that we, he, I, the sound editor can go back to any of these places because so often they're in, on location oh yeah yeah um there's a lovely um car chase in dr no where bond is trying to escape the hearse chasing him and there's the screeching of the car with um the, the, the tires on the on on the on the on the road and then the hearse going over the side of the cliff and the one for rumble yeah. on the way to a funeral yeah. yeah that's really i think a really good example of your of your work yeah very good but, uh, yes i must say that the sound of it going down the cliff i'm rather proud of that i can't quite remember how i did it but it certainly does the trick hmm. the yeah. only thing about that scene is that when bond when you're on bond it, it looks it, it it doesn't look real and <laughs> no no um, uh, but there we are. But, but I think in a combination of your sounds and the, Peter's editing, of course, you it, 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 I don't think anybody really questions it, to, to be fair. Um, no, and of course, fortunately, there were enough shots on the, on the bends in the road to be able to put screeches, which obviously give it some, give it some life. Yeah. Um, because obviously it's a uh, dirt road, but then again, the screeches perhaps you wouldn't in real life perhaps hear that on a on a gravel sort of sort of road. But it's it's not about it's about having a sound that fits rather than necessarily what you hear in reality. I suppose that's again the key. Yes, in, in the Bond sound versus a normal you know film sound. Um, yes, normally of course. With all car car sequences, car chases, I go off afterwards with the sound crew and the right car and the right driver, mm. and I, I draw everything and time everything, and we shoot, re-record every shot again. Mm. 
but on on that i didn't really they were basically library shots not yeah. library sounds yeah. you know i just needed a, a roaring car and loads of tire squeals really yeah, yeah. um and the other but the is, other car, when he yeah. goes to see the the girl up in the hills, that yeah. I recorded all that separately. Oh, with, with the actual the actual car itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, because uh, because when Bond goes to visit the the the, the, the girl, um, yeah, in 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 the hills, she's in her her um a, a towel for her hair and a towel. Yes. Her, and when Bond sort of starts to seduce her, you you. Hear an interesting sound, which suggests that Bond is doing something behind her back, and you hear like the sound of a, a, a zipper being. Y like, yes. But of course, it makes no sense because she's only got towels on. But it, but it really adds something to the the sequence. Yes. Doesn't she say, "What are you doing behind my back?" Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, I've but, never forgotten that actually, because when we were in the recording theatre. It's, it, it happens quite a lot in sound, uh, recording sound effects, but mm. often the actual, if you use the right prop for something, mm. it doesn't sound right. And you yeah. have to mm. use something else that sounds as though it is right. Yeah. It's a bit like it's famous when people do sword fights. Invariably, mm. they don't use swords. You know, they mm. use glasses and all sorts of other things. And I know we kept trying to get the sound of a zip Mm. And it always sounded like a fart or something. It never seemed to be what people would immediately yeah. relate to a zip. Mm. Uh, Can't yeah. remember how we finally cracked it, but uh, that was one of the events yeah. I remember. Because one of those things that if you didn't have that sound, it would the scene wouldn't have wouldn't have worked so well. So it's no the, the story. You know, even though the, the logic of the scene, you know, is a separate thing, but it. You, it's movie logic, isn't it? It's sort of adding. Yes, yes. That pushes it forward. Um, yes. And, and I suppose the other example that I, I noticed recently was when Bond and um, Honey Rider go into Doctor No's um, apartment. Uh, they get off the elevator and then they go and they see Doctor No's layer, if you like. And there's this lovely sound of like wind chimes in the in the giving. Again, you can't really see where the sound's coming from. Yes, I, something I don't remember that. Mm. I wonder who that certainly wasn't me. So I don't recall that at all. It's interesting. I wonder who put that on there, unless it was all part of the score. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, either it's meant to be wind chimes or say a, chan a sound of a chandelier or, you know, the crystals knocking together. It's that, that kind of sound. Yeah, no, no, you, yeah, no, it interests me that. Mm, yeah, but, I remember the scene very well. I remember them getting out of the out of the yeah. lift. Yeah, but it keeps the, the 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 pace and the sound. It keeps the sound. It keeps the film moving, doesn't it? These these incidental sounds. You know, because if it you know it's it, you as an audience, you're expecting to hear this 3D world, and of course, you need those little sounds that some of you might think, "Well, why do you need the sound of this?" Actually, it's part of the Really right. Piece. Um, I just want to talk about some specific sounds in, in the film that we haven't already touched on. Um, uh, you mentioned obviously the, the crushing of the Buddha statue being very uh, uh, yeah very key one. Um, do you remember how you how you did that crushing effect? Was it particular? Well, used this or? is a this is a typical example of why I think Peter gave me the chance to to take on a film of that size hmm. was because having worked with that Winston Ryder, he never actually called me across and said, look, Norm, you know, this is the way you do this or this is the way you do that. I just watched the way he worked for those three years I worked with him. Hmm. And one of the things that he taught me was that if you've got a very difficult sound, as that was, don't try, don't spend hours keep trying this and trying that, trying the other. You you record or acquire a, cer a certain number of ingredients that you feel would contribute towards it, yeah. and then you can go into the recording theatre with all these different ingredients, and you can say, well, try three with four, and the first three with five, and try different combinations, mm -hmm. and the, the the mixer would be giving trying different things and eventually between you you would say ah now we're getting somewhere that 
bit more of that one and less of that one. And finally, you would come out with, with, the, with the sound. And that's how we created that. Hmm. Yeah. There were a lot of sounds went into that, just like the, just like Odd Jobs hat. Hmm. Yeah. You can't make sounds like that. Well, you could eventually maybe, but you could spend hours. But once you've got the ingredients, and that's why that um, sound mixer at Pinewood, that's why he tapped on my door. He wanted to. He wanted my ingredients so that he could sit there. <laughs> and of course, he he mixed that for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. he 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 mixed that. We sat there together and decided which were the best ingredients, and finally came up with it. Hmm. Yeah, I remember um, when, I, when I saw it last week on the, in the cinema, and it, it almost it took me out of the picture a little bit because I went, "Oh, that's that's Norman sound," and I went, "Oh, you know, uh, I get." I've always, I've always said to people that even even with modern technology, I, there's no way I could improve on that, and I don't <laughs> think anyone else could either. It's just one of those things that works, you know. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, a bit absolutely. like of Jobs hat. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, uh, of course, there's a mechanical dragon in 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 the film. Um, how is it creating the sounds for the um, the, the, the the dragon? That, um, so the, um, the and the breathing of fire and all yes, that. well, the, Bond actually I don't know if he still in says it in the film, but he actually said the name of the of the uh, of the vehicle. Hmm. I'm sure, sure he said what the vehicle was, didn't he? Did he? Oh, he did say it was a, a dragon that runs on diesel en a diesel engine. So he does sort of say it's a diesel vehicle, but I don't think he Diesel, said, yes, that's yeah. it. That's it. So I knew that I had to have a, a diesel vehicle. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so I went to the libraries and, and looked for various... I, I, I didn't go out to try and shoot that. It wasn't worth it for such a short scene. Mm. And... Um, and then, of course, the flames. Again, I got uh, anything I could get from the sound library that I thought would contribute. Mm. And then again, we we mixed it so that it produced the sound that I needed for the right length, of course, because they're just short bursts to start with, aren't they? So yeah. I had to get them yeah. timed exactly right. Mm. And the other sound I wanted to mention was the sound of the um, of the wheel on the reactor. I believe you're quite proud of of that one. On the balcony? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, I've always said to people that I think it's the only time in my life I've really known what real stress is. And <laughs> because throughout the film, I had enough to do as it was. It was a busy film for a first timer like me. And I, all the time in the back of my mind was, I've got to find a machine that will create the right sound and have a control that we can synchronize with that damn wheel. Hmm. And time went on, I tried, I went to libraries. I could not find anything that was correct, right for it. And we'd reached a point by then when we were now dubbing, we were mixing the tracks together and we'd gone through real one, two, three, four, five, six. We were getting nearer and nearer to the end scene and I still hadn't found a machine. And that was such a worry to me. Mm. I had other things to think about, you know, but to have that on my mind, and I knew that everyone would just assume that there would be a sound on there. Mm. No one would say, well, no, 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 you know, <laughs> what have you done? Mm. So anyway, cut a long story short, finally in desperation, I went to the, I went to the man in, in the sound department of Pinewood who was in charge of the maintenance of all the electronic machinery there. Jeff Labrum, his name was, hmm. lovely guy. And uh, I, I said to him, look, this is my problem. Is there anything you can come up with? And he said, well, it's very unlikely, but I'll give it a go. And to my amazement, two days later, and by now they were mixing real nine. And it was real 10 that it was going to be in. And he called me to the recording theater and I, I just couldn't believe it when I saw what he'd got there. It was a, the, the crudest piece of gadgetry you'd ever seen in your life. Mm -hmm. Bits of this, bits of that, bits of wire, bits of... I said, oh, it's a no. And he pointed to a switch and when I switched it on, it went boom, 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 boom. I said, wow, I said, that's, that's electronic. But he said, no, no. And inside he said, there's a little wheel in there. And when I turned the wheel, it started to increase the volume, mm. the pitch, not the volume, the pitch. 
I couldn't believe it. Everyone in the theatre said, Jeff, what have you done? How have you done that? Mm. He actually invented a machine that could do it. It was beyond belief, really. Mm. It's funny, just talking about it, I get all... <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. He did it in time, and, um, and that's the sound. Mm. Incredible. Another great one, yeah. Um, is there any other sounds in the film that I haven't mentioned that you'd like me to like to discuss? Um, without thinking, working my way through the, um, hmm. well, I, 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 I suppose it's worth just mentioning the the um, silence pistol because when I went round to the libraries, I naturally assumed that they would have a sound of a silence pistol, but nobody did. No one had ever recorded one, right. and I couldn't exactly ask the production company to get one in that I could record. <laughs> So I, um, I went in with various things like air guns and various other things, and, um, and that's what we came up with. Mm. I sometimes think that I could have varied it, maybe had a different one, in, a slightly different one in different parts of the film. Mm. But there we go. I, I, I never really did. I would have liked to have had one with a bit more chalk in it. Yeah. And yeah. Maybe Bond could have used that when he shot shot the guy in cold blood but anyway i, I suppose that there isn't too many silent shots so it you can probably get get away with it if you like just having that one that one sound i don't think anybody sort of you know i, I think it's an iconic sound so uh I don't no think... i would have just liked a slightly different one at the start of the film when they shoot the the lady lady in oh, the yes yes and, and, yeah, yeah yeah slightly yeah. different from the one Mm. Bond had. Mm. Um, so um, um, I can't think of anything else of any real interest. Yeah, um, I, I think some of the other sounds that work very well are these scenes with with, with Bond and and Honey on Doctor No's Island, and the, the, you get a very sense of the, the, the tropical environment and you know, the insects and the and the. The dogs as they're chasing through the swamp and the, the birds and oh yes yes yeah. yes that was a nice chance to bring some atmosphere into it hmm. yeah um, one of the things interesting that you're interested in atmospheres because hmm. sound editors are very aware of it too yeah. and there are certain things that you can do that create an atmosphere hmm. wind riders winston riders greatest thing and i think i don't know of any other sound editor that had it he used to believe in voices. Hmm. He used to love to record voices that he could just use purely as atmosphere. He, you didn't need to hear what they were saying. I didn't get me up to the right there. And, and held right down, it would bring a, a scene to life. That's, there's someone out there somewhere, they, you know, they're not interested in what you're doing. But, and um, I remember we in Solomon and Sheba on the battlefield there, he got all these blokes into a recording theater and got them all to shout these sort of nebulous um, remarks. And then he held them all down and he brought that, brought that battlefield after the battle to life. I, I was so impressed. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, yeah, you could hear these blokes were wounded or calling each other or, lost his sword and I, I never forgot that and I tried to do it when Bond first goes down to the waterside to see um, what's his name? Oh, uh, Coral. Coral. Coral, yeah. Hmm. I went into a theatre with a couple of mates and we, we did these and I thought when when they heard it in dubbing, they said, well done, Norm, well done. But when I hear the film, when I see the film, I can't hear them. So it's either me or they didn't, they got drowned somewhere. I, I think they're there, you know. I think that when I saw, again, when I saw it in the cinema, you can, it, the sound comes through a bit better. And like, and as they walk through with Crowell, there is, you, there, yeah, there are these, Sounds of people's voices in the distance, and of course that's. Oh really? Oh okay then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, I mean um, another thing that people often do is if you want to give, if you if you want to give a, a feeling of remoteness or early morning, a distant dog bark. It's amazing what that can do. 
And there was one in the sound effects library that everybody used, everybody, every sound editor used it because it was just one of those lucky things that someone recorded once and it had all the perspective, all the echo. And you only had to put that over someone arriving in the morning or something and suddenly the whole thing opened up and it was an early morning atmosphere. Hmm. And the other one was crows. If you wanted to create a slightly ominous feeling, somebody turning up at the outside of a building in the early morning and you wanted it to sound a bit, if you had crows, hmm. subconsciously the audience felt, oh, <laughs> hmm. Hmm. there's just something about crows. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, but it's, you're, I can tell your interest in atmosphere, and that interests me. That you you have that interest. You're aware of it. Oh yeah, I think, I think to me that the, the, the sound of any film is just as important as as anything else because it's part of the believability, isn't it, of the of what you're watching. Um, Doctor Knows Laboratory, I thought was quite. I thought I'd made it rather more interesting than it is at the moment. But uh, I, I I mixed various electronic sounds that gave you this feeling the whole place was alive with but um it seemed to be a little bit based on one but I was, I was going to use at least same. you felt it was electronic well i was going to use the same word that you did it it, it sounds a, a, alive when, when i saw it in the cinema last week it sounded like it was this this humming this almost it had a you know it, it like it was a living organism in, in, a, in a way it had this sort of you know life life too. oh yeah I, I, yes i'm yeah. not denying it's got yeah. something going for it but i thought yeah. i'd made it a little bit more interesting yeah so that may have been perhaps lost in in the final mix or something like that perhaps yeah it's possible mm. yeah yeah um talking about the uh, animal sounds there's this really good scene when bond and and honey are in the in the swamp and they're using hollow bamboo to breathe through because they're under the water and the dogs are, 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 are chasing them and they're getting very, very close to them. And then the, the dogs are, I think, spooked by some some birds. And, and of course, then there's this wonderful shriek, almost, I don't know, I don't know if you use, almost like a monkey sound in the, in the mix, perhaps, where they sort of, um, and then they sort of leave and they go away. I don't know if you used, you know, remember using sort of other sounds other than, than birds for, for that scene. Oh, it's very, very likely. Mm. Yes. Um, anything to do with jungles and things like that. There are certain atmospheres that you can get from libraries that immediately bring it to life. Mm. And I, it's always interested me. I've been to three jungles in my life and couldn't hear a thing. And mm. I thought, if I, <laughs> if I left it like this in a movie, I'd be shocked, you know. <laughs> yes. but, but there are, you can bring you can bring it to life with mm. with all the right atmosphere as so long as you don't overdo it mm. oh, and yeah. almost certainly i would have definitely i would have thought had a library atmosphere over that oh yeah 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 it's a wonderful you know uh, sounds to to the island um and the other thing i just want to mention was when bond and honey and quarrel are hiding behind the the sand and they're shooting from the boat and they sort of the the, the gun oh yes with the gunfire yeah and the sound of the bullets hitting the sand i think is quite an interesting interesting sound oh yes yes mm. yeah so, um it, you know has a sort of again that must have probably been a combination combination of sounds you probably found in the library i'm guessing but, um, yes well of course many sounds like that are recorded we, we record them ourselves we have a session over two or three days where we go into a recording theater that has all kinds of props of every description. Mm. And usually when you're trying to create a sound, there's usually something in there that will give you a start, you know, oh, yeah. some prop that will be begin to give you the sound you're after. Mm. It's, I used to enjoy those sessions immensely. Mm. And we had people, of course, that that was their job. They, we would hire them in. We knew them like brothers and sisters. You know, it was the same, same people. And they would turn up, and they were they were so excellent. They could mm -hmm. synchronize footsteps immediately, and they would have an instinct for creating the right sound with the right prop. Hmm. Once you told them what you wanted, then you could leave it to them to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, do you, do you, so when you did see the film 
finished on the big screen, it must have been very satisfying to, um, did it meet all your expectations? Sorry, was I? When you saw the film on the big screen for the first time, uh, did it meet all your expectations? Were you, like a lot of people, blown away with the result? Oh, this is the only problem. Um, when you've worked on a film, hmm. it's very hard to look at it objectively. All you're thinking about is what you did and what you didn't do and how that worked and what the music did that you didn't think it would do and so on and so forth. And that's why I was so grateful all those years later when they celebrated that, that centenary or whatever it was by showing Dr. No, where I was able to sit back and watch it as a film. And that taught me a tremendous amount. What was so interesting was that I've always said to people that I don't care what they say, nobody ever on that film had any idea of whether it was going to be a, a, a flop or a success. Hmm. There was no way of really knowing because you knew that the first half had material that you was priceless. You had an incredible, incredible star in Sean. It was just something the way that that guy played Bond that was so perfect. You had Ursula, who was, you know, what can you say about Ursula? Mm. You had scenes like the tarantula that was absolutely amazing. People hadn't seen before. There was so much going for it. But nobody knew how people would react to Dr. No. Mm. And that was like a second half of the film. And so you couldn't immediately say, oh, they're going to think he's great. They're going to be scared stiff of him. Nobody knew. Mm. And when mm. I, I, I happened to be there, the very, very, very first um, public viewing. Mm. And um, uh, Harry was there, that's right. Yes, not Covey, Harry. And Harry was there and, and we were standing outside and I've never seen a bloke look so nervous. The tension in his face was absolutely incredible. I could mm. see. And it wasn't like him, Harry, you know, Harry was Harry. He, he did. But when they all came out of that theatre with smiles on their face, I saw the relief. And, and it was for me as well that we realised immediately that people had loved that movie. I could tell by the reaction. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, but it was uh, a difficult one to know. I mean, there are some films you work on, you, you're pretty certain you're onto a winner or you're onto a loser, but that was impossible, absolutely yeah. impossible. It, it, it was just so different, wasn't it? it was sort of, it was totally different. Yeah, it was either going to be loved or or rejected potentially. So yeah, um, yes, we used to get um, blokes coming in with with a file under their arm, looking important, wanting to see something on the movieola. But all they ever wanted to see was Ursula. They always, we knew that. They'd say other things, but no, they wanted to see Ursula. And they, they always made the mistake of calling her Ursula Undress. Or you can going on there, yes. <laughs> yeah. But there we are. She was very special, wasn't she? And oh, yeah. 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 I, mean, I, mean, he, I mean, I don't think even, even the, the big success that it was. I don't think anybody would think that 60 years on, we'd be talking about it still, that it was still this fantastic phenomenon that... Bond yes. That, um, it, have you ever sort of got to terms with that as somebody involved with Bond? Does it, does it still surprise you that you're part of this massive franchise that can't be equaled? What's it that feel like? It doesn't, it doesn't really surprise me. Once, once Dr. No was a success, mm. it was the start of something big. There's two, no worries about that. I think what it is, when people ask me, why are they so popular? I always say, well, look, you've got great star, always beautiful ladies, mm. incredible crooks, and the most amazing locations and incredible stunts. Everybody that goes to see a Bond film knows they're going to have all those elements. And so they want to know how those elements are being applied mm. again. Yeah. They know what they're going to get. They know what they're going to get. And, uh, and most times they're not disappointed, are they? Um, so many people might not know that um, you then left the film business and for rather um, 
not unusual career, but one that people perhaps didn't, didn't see coming. Can you explain um, why you left the industry and, and what you ended up doing? Oh, wh why I left the industry? Yeah, yeah. Ah. First of all, I had achieved my ambition of becoming a, a film editor. Mm -hmm. And I, that was always my dream. And I edited six different types of film, thoroughly enjoyed it. And by that time I'd reached 40. And I knew the industry so well. And I thought to myself, right. And I said to my wife and family, the next 25 years uh, will be my working life. Do we want to spend the rest 25 years in work, out of work, in work, out of work, yeah. and always being in the vicinity of London? Because, you know, you couldn't, you could live somewhere else, but you need to be in the hub. You know, you need to be nearby. All the studios are around, surround London. And, and then, of course, Soho was the other obvious place. So we discussed it. And the decision was that, the answer was no. Mm. We wanted mm. to be a family. We wanted to live far more normal life, far more secure and live in a different environment. I'd always loved space anyway. And so we agreed that it would be really satisfying to try and move to the countryside somewhere. The only big dilemma was if we did move to the countryside, what would I do for a living? Yeah. yeah. So I researched the market and discovered that the government were had created a series of of you could call them apprenticeships if you like but they anyway they were training schools where you could learn a trade over a period of about 30 weeks very intense training for people that had come out of the army people that wanted to be made redundant people were changing careers and I thought, well, that would suit me. I'd always been a very keen DIY person. I thought, when we get there, I'll apply and then mm. I'll build myself a skill. Hmm. And it, had it not been for that, I think I would have probably had to have thought about it a lot longer because you can't move, you can't pack up and move and then not have a job. Yeah. yeah. The other advantage was by moving to the country, it meant that by selling my house, I could buy a house that didn't need a mortgage because the property prices were so much less. And so all in all, that was the decision we made and we up, up sticks and away. Hmm. The strange thing was, of course, that as you know only too well, soon after I arrived there, I had a friend that worked at, um, oh, Yorkshire TV, hmm. and he he got in touch with me and said, I work here all the time and I need some help. Would you consider coming up here? Uh, people said to him, why don't you ask Norm because other people might start taking over your place up there, whereas Norm won't, he'd just come in and go. And hmm. I did, I worked in Tilly TV for two or three films and it was just another experience because it was working on 16 mil film and everything mm. and then of course after that quite a few years later um, never say never again came out mm. yeah and um the Amer the editor was american and he had my, a friend of mine was his assistant and the american editor said to him do you know sean isn't really happy with being with completely new people. You know, he made all those films, probably not always the same crew, but it became like a family, the Bonds, you know, and he probably got used to the same cameraman and the same director and all the rest of it. Hmm. And um, my friend said, I wonder if Norm would come back. At least it would be, at least it'd be somebody, wouldn't it? Anyway, he asked me, I spoke to my wife, and we said, what have we got to lose? You know, we would, we, would, we would make some money, which we could do with at the moment, and get it out of the way, and then that'll be the end. And, and that's what I did. I went back, and it wasn't a very happy experience, unfortunately. No, it's one of those films that was plagued, I think, with lots of problems and... Um, yes. Um, In fact, strangely enough, I had a, a message the other day from somebody from the Bond fan club in France, hmm 
I've heard from other Bomb fans, but never from France. And anyway, he got in touch and said, as you worked on both Thunderball and uh, Never Say Never Again, we, I think Never Say Never Again is coming up to its 50th year or something like that, some kind of memorable year. Yeah, I think like 40. Yeah, yeah, 40. Uh, 80, 80, 40. 80, yeah, 40 years, yeah. There you go then. And he said, I wondered if you would be happy to be interviewed. I said, well, if you're interested in getting in touch, yes, but he hasn't been back. But hmm. I thought it was a strange film to memorise, really. I don't think, you never hear the Bomb Pams ever talk about it. It, it, I, I think it's it's quite it's quite an oddity, and I think maybe that's part of its attraction is that it is this sort of only film that's not made from the with the actual Bond family, and and it has yes, it wasn't a neon production, was it? Yeah, it's a lot of history, and of course, a troubled production, and of course, film fans always like to hear about things that went wrong and the more sort of juicy, <laughs> yeah, you know, story. So I suppose uh, I'm. I'm surprised it doesn't get more attention because of because it's it's unique, really. And um, yes, um, so strange to remake a film when the other one hasn't been that long. You know, hmm. if it's 15, 20 years later, you say, "Well, but hmm. not so soon." Yeah, I, I mean, it was, I think uh, Thunderball was sixty-five, and eighty-three was never seen ever again. So. Almost 20 years, it was 20, almost a 20 year gap in between. Oh, it was as long as that, was it? Oh, okay. Um, but they had tried to make it in the 70s, but they couldn't quite get it right, so it took longer than I think they'd hoped to to do it. But it, um, yes, yeah. they had to wait so long to get the right to do it, didn't they? Yeah, I think I think they couldn't do it until at least 10 years had gone by. I think that was that's the, right, 10 years it was, yeah. In the um, oh, the, well, anyway. Uh, um, but of course, so in between the occasional return to the film business, you were very happy as as a plumber, sort of just doing, uh, and that was your your living, wasn't it, for uh, many years? Yes, I, I I went to one of their open days where you could see all the different trades, hmm. and uh, different blokes got interested in different departments, and most of us were interested in the carpentry because this lovely smell of wood and. And they were building staircases and arches, and oh wow, we all uh, you could, and the guy in charge could see it. You could see we all were going, oh. <laughs> but he warned us. He said, "Look, I know you're all interested in what you're seeing here." He said, "But I have to warn you that chances are most of you will end up as roofers." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I listened to that, and. Uh, no, once I saw the plumbing and heating, I, I thought, yeah, that's me. I could, I could get my teeth into that. And yeah, I thoroughly yeah. enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the job. I enjoyed the experience. And I've often said that I think probably one of the greatest achievements of my life was towards the end of my plumbing career was to take on a brand new house and plumb it from top to bottom with everything that you could have, you know, underfloor heating, you name it was in that house wow. and I look back and think how could I have done that you know with 30 weeks training yeah yeah but I enjoyed the life I enjoyed working with other tradesmen I've always respected tradesmen I think tradesmen are underestimated you know most people you could do without but you couldn't do without tradesmen you know? yeah. Yeah. they build they mend they restore mm. They're brilliant really and we were I like the the team thing and I used to say to the guys, when you went on to a, a big job, within a couple of days, they were all turning up, all the different trades, the plasterers, the bricklayers, the electricians, and, and uh, it was just like on a film. Mm. I always remember when I arrived in Jerusalem, on Jerusalem file, as each plane landed, another person arrived, another person arrived, and you build your team. Mm. And it was the same feeling on a building site, all these different experts, yeah. And did anyone know when you were round to do the plumbing that you were this, this Oscar winner and you had this separate career? Did, did many people know or find out when they were? Oh, uh, yeah. After a period of time, of course, it all, it all filtered filtered through. But everybody, everybody treated me like one of them. Hmm. And yeah, you never had um, Bond fans. We asked for a plumber and you turned up and it was like, oh my God, that's... 
<laughs> no, no, it's a different world in the country. Yeah. The only difference between the tradesmen and the film people is that tradesmen, there's always an overlap. Most tradesmen can do, an, they may not be expert, but they can do another trade. Hmm. Most tradesmen could do a bit of plastering or lay the odd brick or, hmm. or even fix the odd pipe. And, and most tradesmen can do some bit of carpentry, but in the film business, it's not like that. It's totally, right. totally right. exclusive. Nobody can overlap anything that other, somebody else does. Mm. Yeah. And I used, to, I used to admire that in a way, that we, everybody was a, looked upon as an expert. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's nice to have that. There certainly is, it overlaps between working in, on a film and in, in, in trade because you're, you're specialist and you're all part of a big puzzle. And yeah, I can see there's a logic to... To, to, to both, I, I think. Yes. Um, I always remember a, a guy from the art department. He knocked on my door one day and he had this, his wife or girlfriend with him. He said, sorry, no, he said, but would you just show show my wife what you do, show her around the cutting room? I said, yeah, you know, bring her in. He came in as well. And the more I told her, the more his eyes grew wide. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell he hadn't a clue. Mm. He, you know, he knew the basics, but the more I told her, the more he was bewildered by what we did. He, he'd he never had the opportunity to really know what editing really involved, all the different aspects of it. Mm. You know, the sound and the, the numbering and the storage. And I thought to myself, yeah, I said, but if I came into your department, I wouldn't know either. I, no. I, I don't know how you create the models hmm. and uh, do the drawings and, you know, design the sets. You know, it's a different world. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's just a few final questions, just the things we haven't touched on today or, or previously. Um, you did work on Call Me Brana before From Rush With Love. With yes, Bob yes, I did. That was one of Peter's. Yeah. I'm not sure... If it, Yes, it, it was after the Bond films had started. It was a film we did in between the Bonds. Yeah, yeah. And c c did you, because um, uh, Bob Hope was the, the lead in, in, in that one, did you? Yes, it was a Bob Hope film, yes. Yeah. It was absolutely amazing. I remember once Peter sent me down onto the set. Hmm. Uh, I can't remember what it was. I, I had to I had to take something anyway to to Bob Hope and we stood there and talked it through. <laughs> I thought, I can't believe this. Hmm. Um, yeah, and I got a Christmas card. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's lovely. Yeah. What's the uh, the text say, Norm? I couldn't quite read the text. Pardon? I couldn't quite read the text from the card. Oh, I, I, oh, it just says, um, may the peace and joy of the Holy Family be with you all through the year. Our family sends love to Bob and Dolores. <laughs> oh, lovely. That's wonderful. Yeah. Hmm. I love Bob Hope. I love the film. Real happy experience to work on a film like that. Yeah, and it's lovely from Rush of Love. They have that poster, don't they? Call me Brown Earth that's part of on, on this wall in Istanbul. So there is a, a bond connection to the to the film as well. If, um, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's what a made bit. you think um, what made you think of that film? Oh, uh, well, just because in Rush of Love there's there's the Call Me Brown poster on a wall in in Istanbul. It's a little in-joke that they they put in and the the villain it escapes through Anita Anita's mouth from the poster, and um, is that right? Ramadellas shoots the guy coming out of it of, of Anita's mouth. So, and you see on the poster, <laughs> the poster does have Harry Saltzman and uh, Albert L. Broccoli on there. So it's a nice little cheeky thing that they put put in there. So um, did you spot that? On your own, of your own accord, no, or did I someone did. tell you it was? No, no, no I, I spotted it. Um, yeah, just because like, I watch the film so often, you see. So, but, um, oh, right, right, nice little, oh, that's remarkable, there. nice little cheeky in joke they did. 
Um, um, I, I, just regarding Goldfinger, um, very famously at the end of Goldfinger with the ticking clock of the bomb, um, it was decided. Oh that, yes. Yeah, it was decided in post production that it would be fun to have 007 uh, be that would be when. Yeah, uh, but it was it was really too late to do it, wasn't it? Yeah, because um, I because I, obviously Sean Connery says three more ticks and he would have hit the jackpot. Yeah, uh, I assume there wasn't just any wasn't time to dub, to, you know, to get Connery back and change it to seven. Or... I'm certain. I'm certain you're right. Yeah. If it had been easy, a you know, five minute job, they would have done it. But as yeah. it is, they knew that most people wouldn't sort of say, "Wait a minute," he said yeah. three. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't think of things like that. You just saw it and realized and. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't notice that until you know many viewings afterwards. I, I think I always thought he said a, a few more ticks. I think that's what I thought he said. But of course, when you rewatch it, you realise it's three ticks. But um, it, yeah. Yes, it was. It was yeah. a little cheat actually, but they yeah. they got away with it. Oh, they did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you ever get a chance to go on the Fort Knox set? Because I know you visited the volcano set, but did you go on the Fort Knox one? No, not Fort Knox. No, I would have loved to have done. I mean, what's so amazing about Doctor No is, and nobody can really come to terms with it, is how did they make that film for that price? Mm. Okay, people will say, yeah, well, they upgraded you. <laughs> no, those sets alone, mm. I think they did made those sets for something like 400,000. Yeah. I mean, it's out of this world. It's too ridiculous nowadays. I mean, you, what could you do for that mm. with, with Ken Adams sets? But the fact, you know, I mean, Doctor Knows the laboratory alone and his and his apartment. Huge amount of work went into that. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and it, yeah. I mean, Ken Adams' contribution can't be understated, can it? It it's, can't be overstated rather, because it it's so much of that larger in life um, but part of the films. And, and e even in Doctor No, where the, the money is is tight, the, the sets are, of course, are, are iconic. So um, it's a huge, huge part of the, the success. Yeah. The, the Volcano set for You Only Twice cost a million dollars. And that was the budget of Doctor No. So you could get exactly. how the money was exactly. just going up and up as, as the film series. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. The only other thing I wanted to mention uh, before we get on to, um, uh, to, 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 close, to close this discussion, um, there was an incident on From Russia of Love where Terence Young was in Scotland and he was yes. in the helicopter and the helicopter crashed in the water. Did, did you yes. think about that at the time? That was in absolutely incredible. It we just heard, we, it, it just filtered back to us. We couldn't believe what we were hearing. Mm. This is the trouble about being in the editing department. We are the backroom boys, you know, we have to face up to that. Everything else is going on in a different world. And, and that was absolutely incredible. I, I never quite knew how serious the, the actual damage to the plane was or to the helicopter. But the fact was that he came out of it unscathed. Well, as far as I know, he was unscathed. Yeah. How it occurred, yeah. I have no idea. Yeah, I assume there was just an, en an engine trouble. And it, I think, I believe it, uh, from what I recall reading about it, is the helicopter just took off and then suddenly just the engine cut out. But the pilot had the foresight to turn the helicopter on its side. So when the, it hit the water, the blades flew off so that everyone could escape without being chopped to pieces, basically. So that's oh, oh, under, I see. under the water and they managed to swim, swim up to safety. And um, I think Terence got back to work the day after or maybe in the, even the afternoon. So, so I believe, yeah, it's quite incredible. Yeah. But when you think of the other event where the, um, where the helicopter came up underneath the cameraman with his legs dangling and he lost yeah. his legs, didn't he? Oh, Terrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Johnny Jordan. Yeah, he lost. Um, I think it's below from the knee down, wasn't it? One of his legs. So uh, yes, um, the other but, side of filmmaking. Oh yeah, yeah. They're they're yeah, it can be quite precarious things, can't they? Either going to locations or accidents and things of that nature. Um, uh, 
the last question, Bond related, I had for you, uh, Norman, was um, do you have a favourite actor or actress that you've worked with? Maybe not on the Bonds, but you mentioned, of course, meeting Bob Hope. Is there another actor that you've met that, um, you know, you, you hold in high esteem? Oh, without any shadow of doubt. Um, yeah, Sidney Poitier. Hmm. In my whole career, I never worked with anyone like Sidney Poitier. There was just something about it. I don't know what happened. We were introduced and we just bonded, completely bonded. And it was extraordinary. It, right through the film, every everything that he could, all I could hear it was, Norm, what do you think? I used to think, well, wait a minute, you know, I, I'm only Norman. <laughs> but I, I got so used to that music. Norm, what do you think? Norm, what do you think? And I don't know what it was. It, I, I was, I, well, I think what it was, because for once I was the sound, I was the dialogue editor. That's what it was. Yeah. And when you're the dialogue editor, you, you can become very close to actors. And, um, And I don't know, we just, we, it was just a wonderful man to work with. I liked his attitude. I liked the way he put me in charge. He was a really, really nice guy. And I think all of us working on, it was called Warm December, it was called. And, ah, right, yeah. Yeah. Um, Julie Christie. I became very close to Julie Christie because... Um, we worked again i was the sound editor but i did both on that film and so i did dialogue as well and we spent three days post thinking um trying to think of the name of the film oh um <laughs> it was the one about the burning of the books i was the sound editor on it, it was it was um where, where the french that? editor the french director francois truffaut it was an extraordinary experience because the man couldn't speak English and he was directing a film in English. Yeah, it was a really funny experience because Julie Christie and um, we became quite close. I know what it was. Julie had been nominated for an Oscar. Yeah. And so while we were working together, she was always asking me questions about what happens, what did you think and how was it and all this kind of thing. So we became good mates, really. Yeah. But she was so good at post synchronizing. I was so impressed. She would just look at the line once, practice it once, and then go for it. And invariably, she got it spot on. Oh, brilliant. Uh, it was Fahrenheit 451, Norm. Yes, Fahrenheit 451. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, I probably I probably let myself down really. Instead, I I thought, well, if I use my schoolboy French with him, I know what's going to happen. He's going to start talking to me in French, and then I'm going to it's going to get confusing. While I pretend I don't know any French, then he'll know that he can stay quiet. <laughs> yeah. And in some ways, I wish I had done my best, but. Um, <clears throat> But it was it was a very good experience, and I always remember he used to listen to what I would say to. Sometimes, if I would say to Julie, if it wasn't quite right, the line she just done, I'd say, uh, "We'll go for one more try," and she'd say yes. And he kept hearing this expression, "We'll go for one more try." And at the end of the film, he had a big party in in his apartment. Hmm. And we were able to take our partners and I took my wife who was pregnant and he looked at my wife and he said, Norman say we go for one more try. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we're just going to finish off Norm. So not only are you um, an Oscar winning uh, dubbing editor, a, um, a experienced plumber, but you're also a, a poet as well. And, oh. um, Last time we had some lovely poetry from you, and I was wondering whether we could close off the event in the uh, the same fashion. Well, you'd like me to read a poem? If, if you um, would be happy to. Well, if you want me to, it, hmm. what one would you would you like? Well, um, you emailed me some some options, and I, well, I thought they were all fantastic. But um, I know we mentioned the Brexit one 
uh, before, but we never we never heard it. So that may be a good one. Brexit. Yeah. It always amazed me that all through that, that terrible period of two over two years, when they could not get Brexit settled, hmm. nobody wrote a poem about it. Yeah, it is odd, isn't it? I couldn't believe it. And I wrote it, and it was in the paper the next day. They couldn't wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. I read a paper every day. I like to see the news. I like to know what's going on and other people's views. When Brexit first came on the scene, I followed every word, especially as some MPs said that leaving was absurd. But Brexit won the vote because it promised to the nation that finally the chances were we'd limit immigration. So off Theresa went to try to put a deal in order but no one thought to raise the point about the Irish border. <laughs> Instead, all kinds of words appeared for everyone to see, words like quota free trade that meant nothing to me. Eventually, of course, a deal was done, consensus had been found, but when our MPs had a vote, majority turned it down. <laughs> Two years have passed since it all began and agreements nowhere near and backstop now is the only word that the public ever hear. It's difficult to understand the problem we've created. And for those of us who voted leave, it's far too complicated. I read a paper every day. It's what I've done for ages. But now when I see the Brexit news, I simply turn the pages. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. And, and, and so relevant, isn't it, to, uh, to today still, of course. Um, uh, you did mention you had one on on COVID and also self isolating. Would it? Could I have those if it's not too greedy? Um, relief from COVID. Yeah. Oh yes. <clears throat> yeah, I quite like this one. Hmm. Relief from COVID. Yeah. I pretended I was married. Mm -hmm. A result of months of COVID is that people feel so stressed that oldies like my wife and I can easily get depressed. We therefore both decided that we had to find a way of changing something in our lives to brighten up our day. We knew we couldn't travel much or dine in the local bar, but suddenly we had the thought of buying a cheaper car. We knew we'd get a thrill from that, as we'd had a car a while. It was time to buy a modern one with a totally different style. I called a friend who works with cars, as I love the type he drives, and soon he turned up at our door with a car that changed our lives. The colour wasn't quite our choice, and nor was the maker's name. Plus, we'd have to change to diesel fuel, but we loved it just the same. The car has changed the way we drive, which sounds a bit dramatic, but finally we share the joy of a car that's automatic. <laughs> that's, that's that, was built, that was built on the fact that I finally got an automatic car and it completely changed my life. I, I, yeah, I've got an automatic, we just bought an automatic car last year. I would never go back to a manual. It's just, <laughs> you're, you're, commuting to work is, is almost a joy now, but... Uh, yeah, yes, it's different. Um, and you've also got one on, on self isolating, I understand. Uh, yeah, we can try this one. <clears throat> Every day I watch the news to check upon the virus, but now I fear I rarely hear some words that would inspire us. Our country is now in lockdown, including shops and schools. So every day we must obey the various regs and rules. Because I'm in my 80s, I've been told I shouldn't roam. They say it's best I take a rest and stay inside my home. 
And when I must go shopping, I feel safe in empty stores. I know I must arrive there just before they close the doors. As for socializing with a lockdown, all, which, which a lockdown always ends, I use my phone as I'm alone to FaceTime all my friends. I do feel for the people who are striving to survive. It's shocking how the lockdown now has totally changed our lives. I'm just a golden oldie who prays it won't be long before the day when we can say the COVID threat has gone. The answer's in the vaccine, as we have so much to gain, and the time will come when everyone can live their lives again. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. That's wonderful, Norm. Yeah, you got a real, you got a real gift for poetry. So I'm very envious. Sorry? You've got a real gift for poetry. I'm very envious. Oh, I enjoy it. And, uh... I like I like the one about my boy. Do you want to hear that one? Modern technology. <laughs> um, but we, whatever one you would, I'd, I'd, I'd have to hear both. No, I've got the time. If you want to. Um... Okay, I, li I like this one. Yeah. Everyone like this one. This one in the paper straight away. Modern technology. I have a son called Damien who's really on the ball. Computers, pads and iPhones, he's expert on them all. I admire his generation as they take it in their stride. While I can't grasp the basics, however hard I've tried. <laughs> Damien tries to be patient, though he finds it quite a pain. Explaining things he explained before, time and time again. I have to write the details down inside a reference book. So when my memory lets me down, I know just where to look. But just when I finally mastered my laptop, phone and pad, I hear again those dreaded words, it's time to upgrade, Dad. <laughs> oh no, I'm back where I started, with numerous changes in store, as lots of the rules that I finally learned don't seem to apply anymore. So it's back on the phone to Damien to hear the new rules that apply. And he always insists it's so simple, I can work it all out if I try. It's not that I'm ignorant or stupid. I had a successful career. It's just that we are now in a far different world and we all just are struggling, I fear. I admit though, technology is amazing. I use Google time and again, and FaceTime's an absolute miracle as I don't have to get on a plane when I want to have chats with my daughter in order to brighten my day. I totally forget when I see her that she's 9,000 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> End of story. Yeah. Yeah, it's lovely, lovely copy to have that, Norm. Very, very nice. And um, I take you're still, you're, you've got more ideas in the pipeline and more, hoping to have more published soon. I've run out of ideas now. I think a lot of people have. There was a time when you could think of lots of subjects for poetry, but um, we're going through funny times and, and they're very careful what they put in the paper. I put in one all about cars, you know, the problem with traffic, millions of cars all over the world and they wouldn't print it. They knew that would depress people. Well, they won't print it, but I'll air it. Do you want to read it to me? I'll get it out there, as it were. Yeah, it's not it's nothing special but i just thought it's something i need to get off my chest yeah yeah it's called living with cars mm -hmm. whenever there's nowhere to park my car or i'm stuck in a long traffic jam i find myself thinking how crazy it is and how totally helpless i am cars have now taken over our lives it's the way we all travel these days but so many cut roads of too many cars and traffic brings countless delays. I always think back to the great Henry Ford and his famous assembly line, when no one foresaw that mass produced cars would change the whole world over time. Yeah. Now over a hundred years later, the truth has slowly unfurled as over a billion vehicles are clogging the roads of the world. Figures have shown that in one year, 70 million cars were produced, yet no one has voiced the opinion 
that such numbers must be reduced. Parking is now an enigma. The most frequent question by far is whether or not when you get there, there'll be a spare place for your car. <laughs> so what is the plan for the future? I suggest one big change for a start that 90% of our drivers will have to drive cars that are smart. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. That's a good oh, one. Uh, yeah. I, I think what's so great about your poems, Norm, is that they're very relevant, even though Brexit is still, well, we're still feeling the effects of that. And, and co you know, you, you've got your finger on the pulse there, which I think is really, which is really good. Um, well, just before I go, I can give you my masterpiece. Please do. <laughs> do you want it? Then we'll. Yeah. I'll let you off. No, no, um, no. I'd, I'd love to have it. Please go ahead. Now. Okay. It's it's called Phone Bliss. Mm -hmm. Today I tried to make a call. Insurance query. That was all. I hoped to talk to someone live who answered queries nine to five. Instead came a recorded voice that told me I must make a choice. <laughs> the voice explained that they could clearly process my own type of query. If I would hear the options given and choose a number one to seven, then press the one that's right for me and I'd be answered instantly. So I listened hard to all the list, but uh, lots of what was said I missed. And though it taxed my aging brain, I listened to the list again. At first, I thought that option three was probably the one for me, but then it seemed that option four might suit my query even more. I made my choice with breath abated, pressed on option four and waited, hoping as I'd made a start meant I would get the right department. <laughs> I listened then to various rings, the buzzings, clicks and tones and things, which made me think in sudden dread that they might cut me off instead. At last, I heard a constant ring, which obviously I hope would bring a human person who was free to talk about my policy. The ringing stopped, I heard a click, I got my question ready quick. A voice came on, but oh, the pain, a flipping record once again. The voice said they would take my question once the lines had less congestion, which of course I swiftly knew meant I was in a bloody queue. Soon I thought I'd turn to violence when I got some dreadful silence, but at last the sound came through, recorded music, dead on cue. The voice kept cutting in to say they're sorry for the long delay, but finally a real girl came to ask me would I give my name. Then came the pause, yeah, computer checks. I guess what she would ask me next. And sure enough, she made the plea, they'd have to check security. I answered questions one by one, my date of birth, and then my mum. I said her maiden name was Wyatt, but then, oh no, the phone went quiet. Someone somewhere had forgotten, pulled a plug or pressed a button. All my waiting on the line had been a total waste of time. There was no way I tried again. I really couldn't stand the strain. I found another way that's better. Just buy a stamp and send a letter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud of that one. I, I think we could all relate to it as well, can't we? It's, we've all had we've all had a, a nightmare like that, haven't we? So <laughs> we've all done it, haven't we? Oh, trying to get through on a bloody phone. Oh, I know. I know. Well, I, I want to say thank you, Norman, for taking the time to talk to me today. It's been really Oh uh, no, I thoroughly been, enjoyed it. You know, Sunday like Sunday. It's been a delight and a joy to speak to you as, as always. Okay, mate, I'll let you go now. Okay, enjoy the rest of your day and um, I'll see you soon. All right, what do I press? Oh, you better press oh, yeah, it. Oh, I'll end it, yeah. Take care, Norm. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Hi, Graham. Hi, Philip. How are you doing? I'm all right, are you? Yeah, yeah, not bad, thanks, not bad. I had lunch on Thursday with John Grover and Vernon and a, a bunch of others, like we do. Us old, we call yeah. ourselves sprocketeers because we, you know, we, we were around when it was all sprockets. <laughs> <laughs> and um, because what I'm doing with what I did with John is I did a little pre-record for a License to Kill event that I'm that that I'm planning. Um, right. 
So I've got, and I spoke to John Glenn uh, as well, and I've got a nice. Oh, little... good. How is he? I haven't seen him yeah. for ages. Yeah, he's pretty, pretty good. We spoke, I think, back in uh, back in February. I think it was now. Mm-hmm. For 40, 40 minutes or so. Uh, you, I usually only, unfortunately, meet him at, at funerals. <laughs> 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 or no, which is the last time I saw it was a it was a Bond event. I think a poem with the last saw him. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I think they've stopped those now. I think um, partly because well, of COVID, but I think it's did Disney's. I think shut them down because they. Um, Oh right, they're now own it all. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think they're taking a long. I think they're taking like a ten year lease or out on it, and I think they're very protective of. Um, sure. Of their yeah. high quality stuff, you know. Sure, I think the last one I went to actually was for Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, which was also the um, Cubby Broccoli, you know. But that, yeah, I, I went to that one. Yeah, that's last. I think that's you, last one. I... Were you there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was there. Yeah, I had. Uh, um, I mean, there were not many of us left. Uh, from that film 50 years ago it was a 50 year celebration yeah yeah that's right yeah, yeah. I'm with, oh i didn't yeah, yeah i was pretty I didn't, you know but i was there I, I wound up um after we were watching the film we watched the film in theater seven did you join us there to see the Indeed. film yeah well the two the two kids uh, not kids anymore came up to the at the end and said come and have dinner with us at the hotel you know which was very nice to catch up on that because you know we were 50 years ago my goodness they were nine and ten years old or something <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. and now sorry 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 no i mean it was, it was a very uh, uh, uh a year of my life on chitty chitty bang bang um which i thoroughly enjoyed of course i took a day off to get married in the middle of it mm. <laughs> and we had our honeymoon in the south of france and in southern germany on cubby broccoli bless him <laughs> oh, wonderful well um, a working honeymoon <laughs> yeah. um what was it such a long period of time just because of the complexity that the film presented well, we started, we had to do two weeks. The first thing I did on it was to do, we had to do two weeks of test because the American producers <clears throat> didn't believe we could do playback on tape. They were still doing it on discs, would you believe? Right. And they said, you can't do it on the tape. The tape was stretched. <clears throat> so the mixer, our boss, John Mitchell, he ordered special uh, heavy duty tape from Agfa. Uh, and we had it put on seven inch reels so we could use it uh, for playback. And mm. I, my first job on there was for two weeks, I just to go start, stop, back, forward, start, stop, back, forward on this tape to prove that it didn't stretch and mm. it could be used. We'd been using tape at Primed for years for playback, you know, I and mean, that's one of, one of those things that we mm. were ahead on. Mm. Uh, anyway, of course, it didn't stretch, and so we used tape. That was how it started, and we and the final days were back in in the in the studio doing green screen, or might be blue screen in those days, mm. uh, green screen stuff. You know that was that was left over yeah. at the end, as there always is. Mm. But here, and yeah, that was a year of my life. And another year was um, magnificent. And their flying machines very similar. <laughs> mm. yeah. well, when you say they were originally using discs, what they kind of like? They know? literally on the on a sound of music, they took a disc, a disc, a, you know, a, 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 um, a disc and a needle. Oh, like vinyl. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and played it as playback. Oh, right. I mean, we, I can't remember ever doing that at Prime, but we were always tape, as far as I knew. We had an old disc player, hmm. um, which was never used in my time. That's from 61 onwards. It was stuck in the corner, but that must have been used before then. But we were using tape uh, for hmm. playback as long as, you know, since six, 1961, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, so, so going from 50 years of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang now to 60 years of... James Bond with, with Dr. No. Um, yes. Um, I mean, it's hard to believe, isn't it, that it's now 60, uh, it is. 60 mm. years old. Um, because you were a um, sound camera operator on Dr. No? No. I, what I should explain uh, to people is that uh, at that time, Pinewood had permanent uh, production staff, which was a mm. mixer, uh, a boom operator, a maintenance uh, engineer. I won't say man, they were, they were all men. A sound camera operator who looked after the recording when they were in the studio, that was in a room 
a, a, a remote room and when they're on location it was on a portable recorder uh-huh. um, and an assistant then called um, a boom operator's assistant because that was what I was taking on as which uh-huh. meant running the cables getting the tea um, but because we were all permanent staff and because production uh, requirements sort of varied a lot I, I would spend, I would get moved around a lot. And I probably, I may have only been on many pictures in Dr. Dr. No included. I may have been on the money for a few days as a mm. holiday relief or an extra hand when it was needed. Um, I put them all on my IMDb, really just to remind me of it all, really. I never, <laughs> but people, they keep coming back like this one to, yeah. to, to, to challenge my memory. Mm. But um, yeah, no, I mean, as far as Bond, is concerned, we all in the sound department worked on every bond for many years. In fact, and this was towards the, the, the latter time of my bonds. That this was recognized by Cubby and Barbara and Michael. In fact, they gave uh, crew jackets to everybody in the sound department because we were all involved at some point or another where there was the transfer bay, shooting ADR dialogue mm. or foley's footsteps and stuff sound effects or in the actual dubbing theater or on the production crew we were mm. all involved somewhere and they yeah. they really recognized this and so they bless them they used to give everybody a crew jacket mm. <laughs> all the time would start a crew jacket at the end mm. and so, so even at, at that stage other films companies weren't recognizing sound apartments in, in the way that the, the broccolis were it wasn't sort of um well, no, I mean, the Broccoli's were, were two, two very uh, <coughs> loyal <coughs> teams, the Broccoli's and the Carry-Ons. Hmm. Yeah. You know, they were like, um, almost like permanent Pinewood movies for, for many, many years. And um, so we, you know, they were like a family. Both of those uh, events were like a family. Mm. And it, I went, you know, I touched in and out. I was on the, in the transfer, but I, I think for uh, the one in shot in Jamaica, I remember I got thousands and thousands of feet with nothing on it. You know, they just kept the recorder mo- run, running, hopefully that something would come in. Mm. Uh, Thunderball. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, transfer bay for that. I really got, uh, I was a few days or maybe a week or so on Goldfinger. Mm-hmm. Um, I did the, I was a boom operator for artist tests on From Russia With Love, which was uh, as an 18 year old, that was quite an event because mm-hmm. um, we were testing a, a young lady uh, in a bed with nothing on, yeah. except a little black band around her neck. Mm. So that was quite, you know, I, I, I've just not long left school and um, I thought, I pay me for this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Anyway, so then in other things, I really heavily got involved as um, as one of the uh, re-recording mixers on uh, Live and Let Die or Man with the Golden Gun, whichever one came first. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> one of those and that was on the re- on the re-recording uh, as a re-recording mixer on all of the subsequent ones up until uh daniel craig took over up to the last uh, pierce brosnan mm. yeah um so uh first of all as a as a sound as a sound effects mixer and then latterly as the chief re-recording mixer mm. Was it a conscious decision for you to move away from the, the, the Bond films after Dying in the Day? Were you kind of sort of be not semi-retiring at that point or to just see if I can actual stopping point? Well, when I stopped, no, I retired um, mm. and, and, uh, before Daniel Craig's one. Um, yeah. In fact, the last, it was interesting, the, the last day of my uh, actually being in the office, I was on. I, I was kept on. I was kept on as a consultant for a couple of years after that. But my last actually day in my office, I walked out through my through the cutting rooms at Pinewood, and in one of them was uh, Martin Campbell, who I knew very well because I'd mixed a few films for him. Mm. And he said, "Graham, come in. Come and look at this." And he showed me these artist tests that he'd done with Daniel Craig for. Um, 
be the new Bond. Mm. And I thought, yeah, he's okay, you know, <laughs> he's okay. I couldn't really, I mean, not really, not really a judge, but I, yeah, he could do it. Anyway, that was the last, that the last thing I really had to do with any Bond it was just, it was just quite fitting that it was my last day in my office as a, as a, as the head of the department that I bumped into Martin on the way out and he, he stopped me to show me this stuff. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Because you'd obviously work get together on Goldeneye, so you had that on Goldeneye kind of and a, and a couple of films I did before him, uh, before him, The Deceivers and Criminal Law, and I did uh, uh, No Escape, mm. which was not a great movie, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I'd mixed with with Martin before, and I knew, you know mm. he, we got, we got we got on quite well. Yeah, I mean, whenever you see Martin Campbell in Bond documentaries, he always seems to be very, you know, on on set, very high energy. You know. Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, he, I, I think he was really a real powerhouse on set, but with mm. with in post production, you know, we got on very well. I mean, he had his very 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 strong views, which was good. But uh, I was able to um, do whatever he wanted. Mm. And I think a lot of fans are probably hoping that he'll. We boot the series for the next film, perhaps that might be because you know. he did save them twice, didn't he? He saved them with Piers, and he saved yeah. them with with, uh, with Craig, uh, Daniel Craig, and I'm, you know, that was uh, not gone miss, not gone unmissed on no, certain no. of us. No, that's right. Um, um, because I, I, when looking at your, your credits for your credit on Doctor No, it does say the uh, it does credit you as a sound camera operator. Does it? Oh, but, well, maybe I was for a while, you know, yeah. which is to say it was probably meant being um, in a room in the sound department with a 35 millimeter sound recorder yeah. uh, in contact with the production, with the floor, with the set mm -hmm. on the stage. And, um, and whenever they wanted to shoot, they, they were, there was a signal of buses that came up. There was a three buses for turnover. I would turn over and in those days, the the film camera and the sound recorder were all locked in by a Celsin motor that was housed in the in the sound department. So my turning on the button turned over the cam anything that was online, which was the camera and the sound. And if we were doing back projection, it would turn over the projector. Mm. So that I would do. That's what I, what I was doing on that, but. I always remember from the early days at Pinewood, I used to get very bored sitting up there waiting for you know them to get ready to shoot. Mm. So I would shoot down to the stage whenever I could and 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 watch what's going on. Yeah. And then I quite often had to really pace it back into the room, and they suddenly said, "No, we won't rehearse. We'll we'll shoot the rehearsal." And mm. I had to pace it back to the room to get mm. in time to turn it, everything over. Mm. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know if you ever, probably we, we've encountered we've encountered Terence Young obviously on the film, but did you ever encounter Terence Young at any point in your, your I, career? I can remember him well when I was on set. I can remember him directing, but you know the likes of junior sound uh, personnel didn't uh, really have much to do with the director, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and. Um, I, I, I tell you, you don't have any specific memories of specific sets or anything particularly no, really I, on on I, that on that film. Not really. I, I mean, uh, if, it, if it is the right one, I can remember the, the set with the bridge that was over the piranha tank. Is that oh, the that, same bit? Um, that was going there twice. Um, oh right. Yeah, and, and that isn't actually on your IMD, IMDb page. So so that might be a credit that uh, should be. You added. only did twice, really. Yeah, yeah. No, no, maybe, it was, maybe um, well, maybe yeah. that was not one that I had any enough yeah. to do with to be uh, to consider I did did anything on. But I mean, I would have been around for for the only tw I lived twice. Was that, that the one in Japan? That would have been uh, yeah, sixty seven. That was so. It would have been sixty six. Sixty seven. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that was uh, that was after or at the same time as Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Maybe. No, anyway, no, I didn't, uh, but I probably didn't have much to do with that. But mm. Mainly, I tell you why, because I had moved in. No, I hadn't moved into the Dublin Theatre. I can't remember why. Sorry, <laughs> my memory, okay. memory comes back. But if I haven't put it on there, then I must have had nothing to do with it. Mm. <laughs> but as you, as you say, because you're Pinewood staff, you're 
seeing yep. productions come in and out all the sort of time. So sure. um, and I imagine you probably would have, you know, the, the, the hoopla about the, the volcano set. Chances are you would have, you know. Oh, been... yeah. I remember the volcano set, certainly. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think it was the the submarine set, um, which was that one on? Oh, the three um, uh, Spy Love Me. Spy Love Me. We we must have had not much to do at the time, so they actually got us sound guys involved mm. with wiring up all the public address system in the in the in the 007 stage. So mm. I, I can remember spending a, what, a week or so running cables around the the gantries of the 007 stage before mm. the shoot. There, yeah. yeah. But we were, you know, that's why I'm saying it was, we were all a, a team of, 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 of permanent staff who were moved around all over the place, whatever, whatever was needed and wherever it was needed. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I just checked that your credits and Chitty Chitty Bang on a 60, 68. So, you know, twice would have been the year before. Uh, yeah, well, it must, it must have been, um, we were shooting in 67, yeah, so because that's when the year I got married, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> I mean, what, I mean, even, even though you were on Dr. No, say, a couple of days, would you still have been very interested in seeing the, the film on the big screen? Would you actually... Oh, you I mean, yeah, I don't think anybody actually at the time knew what a big, successful movie it was. We didn't, really. I mean, it was yeah. just an interesting... I mean, every film for me, honestly, at that age was interesting. Hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it was, certainly was. And obviously after the success of it, you know, we we, we followed and, and became part of what I would like. I love to think we were, were part of the Bond family because they all the sound was finished up in the Pont and the Pinewood Sound Department for many years. Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, mean, I mean, do you remember seeing Dr. No and thinking, oh, this is a... A bit of a game changer. I don't, I'm afraid. No, I don't think anybody did, to be honest. Yeah. No, we didn't. It's a bit like Star Wars. Everybody hated that. I mean, <laughs> I could I can remember well, walking through the sound department sometime and they were running rushes from Star Wars from what they'd shot in North Africa somewhere. Was it Morocco or Tunisia? Oh Tunisia. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I was, I was just, I was just out walking through the, in, in the sound department. I looked through the production room board and there were these endless shots of sand and little tiny people moving around. Hmm. And everybody was saying, this is a, this is a turkey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How wrong can you be? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think, yes, the same with, with Dr. No, I think people were saying, yeah. oh, it's, you know, it's disgusting sex and violence that will never catch on and all these <laughs> kind of things. And, um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, um, but I mean, I mean, how important is, is it to you from your career point of view and personally to be involved with the Bond franchise and to, you know, have that on your, your credits and being part of the Bond world? Uh, well, I'm, I'm partly because every Bond was a pleasure to work on. I mean, Cubby was really the best boss ever. He looked after us very well. Hmm. He, he, we worked long hours. Um, but he paid us well and he fed us well, you know. I, mm. I have a particular memory of one of the early ones, and I can't remember what it was because they had good parties. They used to have great parties. And there was an end of picture party at Pinewood, and I really can't remember which film it was for, but I was very, very, um, very, very junior and probably didn't have much to do with the, the movie that we were having the Christmas part, uh, the end of picture party for. Mm. Anyway, we, they were held in the Pinewood restaurant, um, which you're aware of, and yeah. coming into the top entrance by the stage, we walked along this little corridor, and Cubby was there uh, welcoming everybody, and I, and, he, and I came up, he shook my hand and said, hello, Graham. Welcome, Graham. I, I mean, I, I had no idea how he knew my name. Mm. Maybe... Maybe he had somebody tipping him off, but even if he did, just to go to that trouble, you know, mm -hmm. to yeah. uh, you know, to make himself uh, present personally aware of everybody, which mm -hmm. was just so typical of Cubby. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. did you ever encounter Harry Saltzman at all? 
We did. Uh, he was not such a nice person as Cubby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, no, he wasn't. I mean, they did spl split up quite early on. Uh, mm. he's, he was a, a powerful producer, but he didn't have the charm of Cubby. Uh, did you ever encounter um, Dirk Meddings? On oh, yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah, no, I knew Derek fairly well. I mean, uh, last time I saw him, well, last time I remember, uh, was a picture. Um, oh, it was a, Ger a German production. Uh, mm. da, 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 um, there were two sequels. I was on the second one about a flying dog. <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember that one? Oh, of, of, uh, the oh, story, never ending story, yeah, yeah. never ending story, too. Yeah. Sorry, it, it uh, gradually comes back. Yeah, yeah, no, I remember at the end of never ending story, Derek was the special effects on that, and the and the producer took us to a very, very pleasant after thank you dinner in, in Cookham. I remember near me, yeah. <laughs> with Derek, with Derek was there, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it always came across, and again, what I've seen on, on documentaries is a very sort of kind, gentle sort of sort of chat. Yes. Really. Yeah, yeah, and no, one one of the interested gentlemen. We have a few. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I think a, a, an awful awful lot. Yes, um, in my well, in, in in my experience anyway. Um, well, everyone I seem to speak to always when I ask them what the favourite studio was to work with, they always say Pyramid Studios, whether they're English, American, or Australia, mm -hmm. whatever have you. What do you think, having worked at Pinewood for so long, what makes Pinewood, you know, the, the best studio in the world? Oh, well, apart from working there for 46 years, um, <laughs> it obviously was a big studio and did a lot, a lot of very important movies and was pretty well, well, up until Rank sold it, it was always owned by the same people lots of other studios changed ownership Shepperton changed ownership mm. a couple of times in um well we bought when we bought it in the end but um no it was the, it was the consistency i guess and it was again like a big family it's just a great place to work mm. uh, it really was it was a sad day when we um went what we call for war when they actually decided that they had to get rid of servicing uh, productions with our staff hmm. um, uh, and that didn't apply to post-production we kept hmm. the post-production staff going and I at that time I had been my boss had been saying oh you know why I want you to go to the dubbing theater I want you to go in, uh, you know in, into the mixing theater and I said no he'd been saying for me quite a while I said no I, I want to be out I want to be out being a boom operator or being out on set uh, anyway, along came whatever it was, 1970, 71, when uh, we had to go, we went for a wall and he came and he said, well, we're going to let all, uh, have to, uh, sadly, let all the production crews go. Mm. Do you want to go in the dubbing theatre now? <laughs> and I just had a, just, oh, I have a very young baby and a big fat mortgage, so, and there was no work outside. So, of course, that mm. was, uh, that was no, a, a no brainer and yeah. I never regretted it. I, I just I went on uh, just it was it's slow progression in uh, uh, in Pinewood um, permanent staff you know it's not like some of the rapid uh, uh, promotion that you can get if you're freelance and you get on the right film with the right people we mm. just it was just slow but I mean I just enjoyed every day of it so mm. you know <laughs> there's more than money <laughs> that's right um, I think when, when Moonwaker um, was being made, it was tax wise, they had, they moved the production to to France because the film industry wasn't that, that great in the, in the 70s. What was it like for you as a as a, a member of the Pinewood uh, staff? Around well, yeah, we, we were there were two things sort of things that happened that we noticed as sound people. One one was the uh, the musicians union problems which meant that all of a sudden all the all the music was being recorded in eastern europe uh, for uh, those reasons and the tax incentives or the tax advantages of not shooting in the uk uh, there was not just france there was spain there was ireland there were lots of reasons where where stuff was done in 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 um, different countries 
we I remember for a number of Bond films, we had the Foley's were farmed out to uh, a French company, um, but they were awful. We had to do a load of them, some of them again, you know. The thing about Foley recording or sound effects recording is you look at the shot and if there's something very important, you spend a lot of time getting that right. Um, mm. And I remember the particular occasion, I can't remember which film it was, it was Roger Moore, I'm sure, he's climbing up the Greek mountain with on ropes. And uh, the ropes are a very important sound of, for his safety. Yeah. And they were absolute crap. So we had to have them all done again in England. <laughs> the oh, sounds for well, yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a few eyes only, that one. Yeah. 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 Mm. Um, um, well, one thing I wanted to ask you about was the Mount Golden Gun, because again, a lot of that was shot uh, in Bangkok, Hong Kong. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, the, uh, yeah. Obviously, a lot of it mainly because of the location, you know, the visuals. Mm. You know, it was quite stunning uh, set, uh, quite, quite stunning locations, weren't they? Yeah. 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 I don't know how much of the interiors were shot there. I really don't know. I think, but, uh, most, I think most of it was probably done in, in Pinewood. I, yeah. Yeah. With, um, yeah. Uh, Scaramanga's Fun House and all that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. Here of uh, the James Bond Island, and um, I mean, have yeah. you have you visited places like the James Bond Island and the locations and things like that? Or not on? No, I haven't. Not on Bond. I, I never went on location on Bond. Uh, mm. uh, I was on location, as I said, from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and uh, well, I had I had a year, one year where I had three locations. One was in. Um, I spent a couple. Uh, uh, first one was Monte Carlo on a film called Kaleidoscope, mm. and then um, uh, what was the next one? I was in Berlin. Oh yeah, I should remember that one because that's where I met my wife. Mm. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, but before that, before we got married, uh, I was on a couple of months in Granada on a film um, with the Aubrey called. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, uh, memory, memory missed that title at the moment. Anyway, it was directed by Ken Anakin, and um, the location was uh, supposed to be India, and we were mm. using the Sierra Nevada, Nevada, so we were based in Granada in the southern Spain. And uh, having met my now wife uh, on the location in Berlin, and things were moving so she actually made her way down to Granada by train from Berlin and we so she spent time with me on location down there and then uh, as I said the next location was in on Chitty, Chitty Bang Bang where we actually got married or oh, got married here but we, were, <laughs> we went to, mm. for a honeymoon there yeah the long duel was that movie ah, long duel. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. I mean, would you have encountered um, somebody like Christopher Lee at any point? Because I think he was... Christopher Lee? Well, yeah. I mean, when I spent before the, um, the first 10 years when I was on production, I'm sure I encountered him on set in, in, uh, some, in one or other movies. Because hmm. um, uh, there were quite a lot <laughs> that I worked on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to think if there's anything particular with Christopher Lee. Mm. I've certainly met him, but it may have been at Bond parties or something. I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> I know he did a, a Bond convention in '96, which I, oh, right. which I, did, mm. I did go to. And I was I was trial at that at that time. Yeah. This is my first one at Pinewood, and mm. but of course, you know, I, I, no real memories because it's so long ago. But yeah. Uh, people that I have spoken to who worked with Christopher Lee tend to sort of say that he was quite si very serious on set, even if he was doing his his back pillow and, and things that could very easily be sort of taken yeah. fun of. I remember when I met him, I worked on uh, Billy Wilder's uh, Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, where he played Mycroft. Right. Yeah, the first time without a wig. I remember that. Yeah, and he was, he was a serious actor and... Yeah. Uh, I can't say he was a ball of fun because he was doing a very serious job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. But um, on on the of those of that ilk, I do remember a very pleasant uh, time uh, when Peter Cushing, who was another charming gentleman, mm. and we 
we met her. I was in the Pinewood Bar one evening. And we met her with my wife and daughter actually, and he was very nice and signed a picture for everything for my daughter. I got it, got it here around there. Well, she's probably taken it now. But <laughs> yeah, no, that was um, he was a very, he was a really nice person. Oh, good, good, wonderful. Um, we, we, last time we mentioned um, some of the Caron cast, mentioned Kenneth Williams and and CJ. Yeah. I was wondering whether you had any memories of the other um, staple cast. Um, mm, well, they were again. This is, uh, as I said, this is like one of the families, and and working on a carry on was just was just such fun. It was just mm. fun all day, serious fun because we were making a movie. But uh, there was no shortage of laughs. I mean, Kenneth Williams kept us amused throughout the day. Uh, yeah. You know, when he wasn't actually on set. Uh, Sid James, I remember spending a lot of time on the phone to his bookie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, what else can I remember about them? They were all nice people, obviously. I can't remember any nasty people on the, on the carry-on at all. Mm. Um, Kenneth Williams, I, you know, I used to... I got, on, got very well with Kenny. I remember on a film called um, Twice Around the Daffodils, which was sort of in a sanatorium, and there were games like drafts and chess. And in between yeah. shots, we would sit and play play board games. And I never thought about any sort of untoward approach. He, he oh. certainly never made any untoward approach, which is quite amazing, really, considering... Um, he never, I never saw him make any untoward approach to any young males, which yeah, wasn't right. always the case with everybody in the film industry. <laughs> Some had reputations, and it sounds like. Um, how about Charles um, Hawtrey? Well, yeah, bless him. He was um, quite scatty, quite, mm. drank quite a lot. <laughs> right. um, yeah. He was a bit like you see him on screen, really, only mm. not quite as funny when he was off screen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think the James Bond theme certainly saved. If you want to, if you want to sort of go back to Doctor No for a second in terms of what made it so successful, yep. that one theme, of course, is is one well, of the uh, the key elements. Iconic, yeah, absolutely iconic. You know, and it and it been so recognisable. Mm. And yeah. I know that um, Monty Norman's score. A lot of it wasn't deemed to be that usable, so John Barry was kind of forced to just drop the 007 Bond, Bond, Bond theme into uh, yeah, it, sure. into the mm. film. Um, and of course, John did the 007. Uh, he, he composed something called the 007 theme, which was his his yes. attempt to um, to rival the, the Bond theme, I guess. Sure, sure. So that's quite interesting. But no, yeah, I don't think you know. It was just like just so recognisable and so expected, you know. Mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, um, have you seen Doctor No recently? Recently, recently? yeah. <gasps> A while back now on television, I dipped mm. into it. Yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, what, uh, depending upon what else I'm doing, it's quite easy to get sucked in again to to watching a Bond movie. <laughs> Well, they're very watchful, aren't they? And I suppose mm. you, if, if you had to sum up what what makes them so successful, I mean, what what do you think, in your opinion, makes them so? Well, there are things to say about the bot. You don't you don't want to have time to analyze the plot. So yes. one <laughs> of the one of the big successful elements was the fast editing. You know, so mm. that you you were on this you were on this sort of ride. And this ride very often involved wonderful locations, exotic locations. And we in the sound department had to provide an exotic sound track. Mm. Uh, so you're on this ride, you know, and you don't, uh, and the, uh, and it, the ride is uh, something more of a substitute for plot because you just don't want to sit down and think about the plot. <laughs> Otherwise yeah, you yeah. would have come, come apart most of the time. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a ride and it's wonderful. Well, I think it's probably a very nice note for us to, to finish, Graham. So thank you very much for um, spending this, this, um, this evening with me. It's been, uh, it's been delightful. Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. Good to see you. Okay. Good to well, All righty. All the best. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.